Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. This is a great, great group, and I'm very glad you're all here, and thank you for being here. I'm Robert Doerr, and welcome to AEI. I asked uh, Jenna's story and Ben's story and Yuval Levin if I could stop by this morning so that I could not only welcome all of you, but also state the importance that AEI places in this topic. Um, we are, um, we are an, an institution of individual and independent scholars who stand for themselves and their work, and we allow that and we celebrate that. But there are some things that we care particularly about and which we put particular emphasis on. And we believe in a liberal education. We believe in free speech. We believe in viewpoint diversity. And we believe in treating people as individuals who are unique and independent and should be judged by themselves, not by their race or class or ethnicity. And we think all of those values are somewhat at risk in the universities in the United States. And we want to talk about that. We want to evaluate it. We want to think about it together with all of you and then see what we can do about it. And so that's why I wanted to come this morning and to say how proud I am and how pleased I am that Jenna, and Ben, and Yuval, and their team, and all of you are engaged in this conversation. This is the second annual conference on the future of the university, and we are very, very pleased and proud to be part of you in these discussions. So Jenna, take it away. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Robert, for that very generous welcome. And thanks to you all for coming. We know that many of you have traveled from quite far away to be, with, be here with us today, and we're very grateful for the time and trouble you've taken to do so. Ben and I feel fortunate to have spent the greater part of our adult lives in the academy, and then to have been welcomed here at AEI to work with wonderful colleagues, and also to have the opportunity to bring together distinguished scholars, teachers, and other people interested in supporting education, such as yourselves, to think about how the precious inheritance of the American College and University will be carried into the future. We come together today in the awareness that education has become a key battleground in American public life. In part, that's for a good reason. Education is important and worth fighting for. It's the way we pass on our way of life and prepare the next generation to take it up and adapt it thoughtfully. But too often, our efforts in this fight degenerate into a stale shooting match instead of becoming part of a fruitful struggle. This happens sometimes because we become obsessively focused on starting a program or getting across a policy or preventing one from being passed. And we lose sight of the vision of education that inspired us in the first place. In concentrating on winning, we forget to ask what would constitute success. Ben and I were usefully reminded of the vision that inspired us when we had the chance just a few weeks ago to visit the campus of the University of Chicago, where we met as graduate students. We were strolling around the quad on a cloudy Saturday morning with our children, and we stopped in front of Cobb Hall, where there's a large semicircular bench. It's called the Sea Bench. It was constructed out of some kind of concrete or massive stone way back in 1903, and it's built to last the ages. It's become an iconic piece of outdoor furniture at the U of C, the subject of many a photo in our alumni magazine. And that's because it's perfectly placed to catch undergraduates as they spill out of their classes and give them a forum with which to co continue the conversations and arguments sparked inside the building. Do we really have free will? Is life nothing more than a quest for power after power until you die? Is it possible to escape the conventions of your time? Is there a God, and what does he demand of us? As one of our students at Furman University pointed out, these are precisely the kind of questions that can make for a nightmare Thanksgiving table. <laughs> but for her, and for generations of students in Chicago, they've been turned through the magics, magic of the books they'd studied and the kind of conversation they'd learned to have inside Cobb Hall into a kind of dream. Many of us have such a memory or a vision of education at its peak, which we hold very dearly. Calling them to mind is useful because they can better orient the rightful concern we have today about our colleges and universities 
and focus our attention away from the culture war and on to passing something of what we greatly, gratefully received to the next generation. But in making those inspiring visions clear to ourselves, we should also become aware of their limits. Upon reflection about what was happening outside of Cobb Hall and why we loved it so much, Ben and I have realized that those fondly remembered freewheeling conversations depended on more than what was uh, the formation, the intellectual formation we were receiving in the seminar room. It also depended on things that happened before, moral formation that we and our fellow students had, been, uh, had received from parents and uh, K-12 teachers, from coaches and pastors and priests. And in thinking about what came before, we also were moved to think more carefully about what came, became, comes after those kinds of conversations. We've been led to ask ourselves, what is the effect of those conversations on a life? Do good seminars really translate into better public discourse? Do deep explorations of fundamental questions really translate into a thoughtful and more confident path in life? And if so, how precisely? It is said that what is most contested is often what is most ignored. And indeed, some of the fiercest and least productive arguments arise when one feels very passionately about something one hasn't quite put one's finger on or located as a proper part of a bigger picture. And so with this year's conference, we just chose to put the main focus on a question that quietly underlies all our increasingly contentious debates about the university and which must, in fact, drive the most meaningful and far-reaching efforts to guide its future. It's a question we realized we hadn't posed explicitly enough to ourselves as we tried to cherish and pass on and fight for the vision of education at its peak that inspired us. So what is education? The human being, after all, is a curious animal in that it needs to be self-consciously instructed by others in order to take a full part in human life. But what is human nature such that it needs this particular instruction? What parts of the soul or the self need to be guided? And what are the best means by which to do so? And what is the goal? What is the image of the fully flourishing human being at which we're aiming? Our charge today is to take some of the issues that make education a battleground in, in American public life and probe their connection to the fundamental question of what education is. By doing so, we hope to find the proper place for those concerns, a way to acknowledge their importance while putting them into perspective. This has led us to take an intentionally unusual approach to this conference, both by posing the broad question and by bringing together experts in K-12 education, along with those in higher education, for a conference on the future of the American University. Our speakers today represent five different kinds of institutions a great research university and a national research institute, a fiercely distinctive liberal arts college, a public charter network focusing on character education, and a classical liberal arts high school in the Catholic tradition. We brought these people together, first of all, because we realized that those who have most deeply influenced our culture's thinking about education, people like Plato, Locke, Rousseau, and Dewey, didn't silo themselves in the way we often do into K-12, in college and university sectors, but tried to conceive of the course of human development as a whole. Today, though, it's quite rare for K-12 educators and college professors to work and think together. One place where the need to do so has become especially evident is in thinking about the education of a citizen able to take up the responsibilities of participating in a democratic republic. Universities are quickly moving now to develop programs and subjects like public discourse, democratic citizenship, and education for life in a free society. Leaders of these institutions have told me that they are looking to K-12 educators for guidance, as they are more comfortable talking not just about freedom, but also about the formation necessary to use that freedom well. For our university panel this morning, we are fortunate to have with us two panelists who come from institutions that thrive on asking the fundamental questions the University of Chicago and St. John's College. Our panelists both serve as deans in those institutions and therefore bring not only a scholar and teacherly perspective on academic life, but also the experience of people who have had to make hard decisions to govern the activities of major sectors of the campus. You can find a full account or a fuller account of our panelists' accomplishments at the back of your program, but I'd like to highlight a few things here. 
Amanda Woodward is the Dean of University of Chicago's Division of Social Sciences and the William S. Gray Distinguished Service Professor of Psychology. Among her many awards and honors, she was elected a fellow of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences in 2014. Amanda did her doctoral work at Stanford and came to the U of C shortly afterward, serving there on the faculty for 30 years. She has a great story of why she chose Chicago over other elite institutions that were trying to get her, and I hope we'll hear that in the course of the morning. There are two more aspects of Amanda's work that I'd like to mention as they're directly relevant to our discussion. First, she has an astonishing range of experience and expertise on the subject of education, as her research specializes in infant social understanding and the processes that support conceptual development early in life. And she is a member of the board of the pre-K through 12 Chicago Laboratory Schools. Second, she was one of the seven members of the faculty committee that convened at the behest of President Robert Zimmer to write the Chicago Principles of Free Expression. Walter Sterling is Dean of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, having served on the teaching faculty there for 20 years. As some of you know, know, St. John's has a very distinctive mode of education. The New York Times has called it the most contrarian college in the United States. It's a four years required set of classes in math, science, music, language, and the humanities, entirely composed of seminars led by tutors who do not stand on their expertise, but instead are inquirers along with the students. It takes some getting used to. So we're lucky to have Walter here to represent this unique approach as he has not only been explaining it to countless audiences, I'm sure, in his nine years as dean, but previously undertook the education himself as an undergraduate, and as I understand, even grew up on the edge of the Annapolis campus, where his father was a tutor and a dean before him. That is institutional knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed this kind of deep expertise and, and, and uh, feeling for the place, I think is, has probably been one of the things that has allowed Walter to be such an effective dean and a part of a team that recently undertook a financial restructuring, a tuition reset, as they call it, um, in a very contrarian way. St. John's actually lowered the tuition and uh, had great success with that, and a major capital campaign while keeping the college true to its mission. Walter holds a degree from Emory University in philosophy and an MBA from Notre Dame and has taught at Loyola University, Maryland, Temple University, Gwynedd Mercy College, and the Rome Institute for the Liberal Arts. So please join me in welcoming Amanda and Walter. Great. So I'd like to begin with a subject that has become a flashpoint in the culture war, free speech. Amanda, as I mentioned, you served on this committee that wrote the Chicago Principles of Free Expression, which um, uh, was potentially in, originally in, in, uh, excuse me, intended as an internal document, but which has become very influential um, on the landscape of higher education. It's a document that's been adopted by 99 other universities and counting. I think when I last looked, there were some that signed this document in March 2023, right? So it's still, it was, it's, it's, it's been quite effective for about a decade. So Amanda, first of all, I'd like to get your thoughts on why free expression is essential to education. And secondly, I'm curious to know what effect your committee expected this document to have, whether it was intended as an internal document. Did you foresee the consequences it would have on the higher education landscape, and what do you think those consequences are? Thanks, thanks for the question, and thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really excited and honored uh, to be here. And I, I just want to say, when you were talking about Cobb Hall and the kinds mm -hmm. of uh, conversations, I, I have taught the core in Cobb Hall for since I began at the University of Chicago, so that's a wonderful part of my own experience in education as well as mm -hmm. an instructor. So um, um, it was um, a, a, a wonderful experience for me to serve on the, that committee that Bob Zimmer commissioned um, mm -hmm. and led by Jeff Stone, a really outstanding scholar and colleague. Um, and what we did, I, it's sort of two important things, is one is we didn't invent any principles. We wrote down principles that had been at the core of the University of Chicago's culture since its beginning. And if you read the report, that's evident because we, we quote leaders, you know, um, academic leaders at the university through and through. So we, we wrote it down in a, in a format that is pithy 
and engaging, but, but captured a culture that, that we had all been in. And at the time that um, we wrote it, I wasn't sure it needed to be written. I didn't under, I thought, well, we all know this. Why do we need to write this down? But um, President Zimmer understood that it needed to be written down at that moment in time. And through my service on the committee, I, under, I came to understand why that, why that was. Um, so maybe I'll say just a, a bit about um, your first question, which is why is free speech important for education? Um, in that committee, free speech is obviously um, a, 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 an important um, um, idea of sort of across society in lots of ways. It has a particular importance within scholarly work in the academy, and that was the focus of our committee's work, under explaining and, and sort of interrogating why free speech is important um, for the work of a university. Um, and it pertains both to the university's research mission and to its pedagogical mission. And I want to start with the research mission and, and get to the pedagogical piece. So um, universities are communities of people who come together to understand, to create knowledge, to um, advance um, human knowledge. Um, and of course, I mean, it's obvious to all of us that a fundamental um, uh, a sort of starting point is that um, faculty have to be free to express and formulate any idea to invite um, any, all the interlocutors they want to engage in conversation. You sort of can't get off the ground with that mission unless you have that. Um, and that was the, much of the focus of that, uh, of that committee report. There's another piece um, at a university, which is that it's not just enough to express, which is a, you know, a fine thing to do. We're not just tweeting. We're not just you know, shouting into the wind. It's a conversation. So universities succeed in doing their work by having people express ideas and, having, and, and engaging in evaluation with colleagues and others. That's how, that's how fields work. That's how universities work. Um, and so it's just as important as it is to be able to have unfettered and free ability to express your ideas, it's equally important to have unfettered and free um, opportunities for critique and evaluation of ideas. Universities are all about evaluation. Every single thing they do at some level is about evaluation, right? And that's a hard project. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's a conversation, it's a discussion. And in my time at the University of Chicago, I've, I've come to um, really benefit from the robustness that that, that kind of interaction has there. Um, so it's also a wonderful place to do education, that kind of setting where you have people working together, discussing and arguing to figure out, to advance knowledge is a wonderful place to educate students at all levels, undergraduates, graduate students, um, and all, all kinds of students, um, maybe even undergrads. Um, I mean, maybe even uh, 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 you know, uh, primary school students. Um, both because you're generating knowledge. Students are there where the latest insights, the latest discoveries are happening. But maybe more importantly, because they're educated within the context of these discussions. So they're educated, they're brought into a culture of discourse and argument. And there's, so there's a lot that our students are learning, and, I, and our graduate students are learning this, as well as our undergraduates, and I would say our junior faculty are also learning it. I learned it when I went to the University of Chicago. Um, how to um, have the fortitude to state your ideas clearly, that's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to formulate a clear statement of what you think. Um, how to listen intently to other people and formulate appropriately thoughtful and critical responses to what they say. How to hear criticism from others. This is really hard, right? We all know that. How to hear criticism from others and use it constructively. Um, how to engage in conversations with people with whom you disagree and are likely to continue to disagree. Um, and finding ways to keep those conversations fruitful. So th th this, I think, is at the core of what we are um, educating our students uh, to do at the university. And it should be, yeah. Can you tell us about um, a moment in which you, as a junior faculty, learned something essential to participating in this debate? You said um, that you have to educate people, you have to cultivate uh, people to be part of this kind of conversation, whether yeah. they're very young undergraduates, but really even as they get initiated into the community as quite fully formed scholars and teachers, or almost you know deeply formed, extensively educated scholars and teachers, is there something that stands out 
in your initial experiences there. Do you want me to tell the story? You could tell that could story. Tell if it's that, I don't know other stories. Um, so, <laughs> so in, it was about, um, it, it was more or less about exactly 30 years ago, right? In, in 1993, I was on the job market. I had been a postdoc uh, for about a year at Cornell, and I was, I applied just for a few jobs. Uh, and I got two interviews, and one was at the University of Chicago, and one was someplace else. And I got an offer from the first institution first, and I thought I would take it because it was um, a department that was good in my field. It seemed like the obvious thing to do, and I didn't know too much about the University of Chicago. I had been an East Coast, West Coast kind of, uh, you know, the piece of my education was missing there. And um, but I thought I would go and do the interview, so I did. Um, and during my, you know, you do a job talk when you when you interview for an academic job, you give a lecture, and my it was one sentence, really just one sentence. In my first slide was up. Um, and somebody stood up at the back of the room and said, you're wrong. Um, you're just wrong. And what was up were like sort of just basic starting assumptions to <laughs> you know what I was going to say. And, uh, and, um, and I thought uh, a couple of things. I thought, well, this, I've never had this happen before. It's one thing. And then I thought, um, it doesn't matter because I'm going to take that other job. So I'm, I'll just argue with this guy. <laughs> and, um, and before I knew it, the whole room, it was a University of Chicago event. Everybody was arguing. People were having side conversations. But it was all about what I was doing. It was all about my work. It wasn't you know, total chaos. Um, and by the end of that experience, I thought, well, I guess this is probably the job that I want to have. You know, these people um, may not agree with me, but they are definitely listening to me. <laughs> and, that, and that was um, so. That was my, my first. Okay. And I want to say I'm still arguing with that guy. He's still my guy. <laughs> he still disagrees with me. Now that I am in an administrative role, he disagrees with my administrative decisions. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just arguing with him last week. Yep. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Walter, what do you, is, is this the kind of conversation we'd see going on at St. John's? St. John's is a place that's famous. For, for conversation, famous for discussion, and that's something you actively try to cultivate in your undergraduates, and I imagine also in your tutors, right? Um, is this the kind of conversation you're aiming at? And if so, how do you do it? If not, what are you aiming at, and how do you, how do you cultivate people to have the kind of, um, the kind of conversations that, that you aim for? When you say, is this the kind of conversation, you mean what uh, Amanda just described? Or yes, what, where, you where, where you know, someone starts to talk and, and they're immediately interrupted with a, a fundamental challenge to their mm -hmm. basic assumptions. Yes. So we, we coach our folks out of this is wrong into, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe what you're trying to say is, <laughs> is, is this. But, uh, Amanda, here's where you step in and say this yeah, is wrong. But I'll, I'll speak to that more directly. <laughs> yeah. I want to uh, join Amanda in thanking you, uh, uh, Jenna and uh, AEI. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor and humbling to be here. I see colleagues in the room that can probably speak about St. John's and, and liberal education uh, as well or better than I can. But I'm happy to, happy to be a part of this, and I think it's so, so important. Uh, and, and I'm happy to talk about St. John's and liberal education generally. And it's important to me, we, we, we have been branded the most contrarian college in America. I'll, I'll carry that water. Uh, and we're, we're proud of what we do differently. But it's important for me to uh, say that I think of us as surrounded by allies throughout higher education. I don't view us as, as a lonely uh, beacon. I view us as trying to do something in a particularly intense uh, and distilled way that I think many educators everywhere are, tr are trying to do. Um, you know, I also want to say that, that uh, I think the Chicago Statement was such an important moment. We spent years uh, looking at it and talking about it at, at St. John's. Uh, it, it, for all the reasons Amanda suggested, I too would uh, say that it's right at the heart of what we're trying to do. I, I would put less emphasis in the St. John's context on <clears throat> faculty research and so on because that's not the heart and the center of what we're doing, but the kind of conversations we have where we're going to discuss fundamental alternatives to the deepest questions can't help but invite challenging and oppositional uh, interpretations of the human condition, can't help but in a certain way challenge and offend our sensibilities to hear things that are, uh, that are so different than our own starting points. And we're doing it through reading this wide range of classic texts that themselves offer fundamentally different positions. And we can't even begin to explore them on their own terms if we're uh, not going to have the widest possible arena for uh, free inquiry. 
we, we did not endorse any new statement in the end. I would say administrators at the college speak to this more and more, but it says something about, I think, our small learning community that we've fallen back on formulations that we had in place, you might say, before this moment that's catalyzed so, so much debate about um, the possibility to continue uh, to have free inquiry on college and university campuses. So we have documents, a statement of the program, notes on dialogue, various things that we rely on to state our culture and approach to the classroom. We talk about civility and a civility policy, uh, civility standards in our classrooms, and we try to articulate that. We say in a, in a sentence that I'm prepared to, you know, <laughs> Uh, defend the ramparts for, we say, reason is the only authority in our classrooms. And that's aimed partly at uh, uh, not constraining where reason goes. It's also aimed at the faculty who are not authorities in, in, in our classroom. Uh, so what we're trying to protect is that seminar discussion that you described you know, quite beautifully before. That's the heart of it for us, students reading, Plato's Republic, or Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, or for that matter, Newton or Einstein, uh, and starting to ask the fundamental questions through the lens of those texts, mm -hmm. and allowing that to be a place of shared inquiry where all alternatives are on the table, submitted to reasoned uh, interrogation. But I do think our ethos is to really emphasize a kind of trust, goodwill, maybe even friendship, that we want to be the platform for that. We're not naive just because you throw 20 people in a room and tell them to read and, and inquire together. That doesn't make them close friends automatically. But we're a very small community and a community of learning uh, where we're engaged in a common enterprise. And it's quite intimate and we get to know each other well. And I think that's allowed us, from my point of view, that's allowed us to maintain, um, fend off, uh, address the kinds of challenges that, that are being had everywhere, being faced everywhere, uh, without needing to, and I love the way you put it, Amanda, not creating new things, but articulating what's been there already. That's the approach we've taken. We do have to talk about it more than we used to, and I think some, um, some of our faculty find that itself a kind of encroachment. Why can't we just sit down and ask the question and get right to it? Uh, why do we have to spend more time talking about the conditions for that? Uh, but I, I look at it differently, I think, in a way that's an extension of the discussion where we're forced or challenged to make more explicit perhaps things we could take for granted before. And that its own, that's its own way of developing community and trust and, and, and so on. So I think everything hinges on this. We can't, liberal education's not possible. Certainly an encounter with the classics on their own terms is not possible. Uh, the self-critique that's at the heart uh, of all fundamental learning is not possible if we, if we don't hold open that space for, for free expression, uh, uh, free inquiry, and reasoned inquiry. So let me ask you both then about uh, the, some of the challenges that that has received in recent years. And particularly, I'd appreciate it if you would reflect on some of the, not some of the sillier challenges, some of those that we can, we can all just uh, groan about, right? Mm -hmm. But some of the deeper challenges, some of the things that are really difficult for you to deal with, particularly as administrators. Um, what are the, what are the deepest or even the best reasons that people are struggling to participate in this culture of free inquiry that both of your institutions have tried so hard uh, to develop? And what can we do to address those, uh, those challenges, those problems? It's a hard question. I mean, I think um, uh, when, when I first thought about it, um, I, I think a, a real challenge is um, just the polarized world in which we live. And people who come to the, our institutions come uh, from as students or even as faculty or graduate students um, come with a, a new sort of 
set of modes of norms of communication that I think are at odds with what Walter and I have been describing, right? So um, the tendency to hold very strong views that may not be all that well analyzed, for example. Um, an intolerance for um, disagreement, um, a, 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 an intolerance for having uh, conversations with people with whom you disagree. Um, and part of that is, sort of is the is social media, I think, which has it connects us all and it divides us all, right? Um, and so the idea, the sort of norms of communication that are brief, shallow, and extreme, right? Sort of, um, I, I think those things mean that people come in with maybe assumptions um, and and ways of communicating with one another that are at odds with what we're. I'm trying to achieve, which is why it's so important to have the kinds of conversations you were just describing, Walter. Even in a, you know, we, we have the Chicago principles at Chicago, that's not enough. You can't just hand it out as people walk in the door. There have to be lots of intentional conversations around this. Um, actually, one, um, there was a, a junior and assistant professor who was new to the university, very idealistic, um, wonderful scholar who came to me at one point. She was mad at something one of her colleagues was saying in faculty meeting. She disagreed with him, and she wanted me to censor him. And I said, no way, I can do that. And, um, and, she, and so she said, well, this whole free speech thing is really you know, kind of a challenge. And then um, she had um, uh, happened to be sitting next to Bob Zimmer at a dinner. Um, and she came to me the next day, and she said, I get it now. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and she has become a really wonderful champion in her teaching and her work as a leader um, for these values on campus since then. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. I think that the hyper-partisan political environment that one way or another our students inherit the idea that all issues come as a kind of us yeah. versus them. And the, the perception, in a way, it's a very sophisticated perception that any claim, and, and I think a kind of tragic one, that any claim to try to chart out a kind of common space or a neutral space or a shared space where, of course, we come from different places, but then we're going to do something together, there's a suspicion that that's just another position masquerading as neutrality or as, as something shared. And, and none of this is new in the last year or 10 or 20, but, but it seems to me our students come very electrified to those issues. And I think a great deal of the benefit and the, and the course, the natural history of a liberal education is that things emerge in the course of doing it that you can't really understand at, at the front end and it can't be guaranteed to you and it can't be articulated as a kind of contract. There's got to be, a, 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 to some degree, a diving in and starting to swim and then realizing you've made progress and you've learned to swim. Or there's got to be a, a, a leap of trust or faith or goodwill. And I think it's more challenging for young people and for everyone, for, for, for humans generally, to take that leap in the environment where we're in. Uh, I still think it works. I, I still think we get there. Uh, but there's, there, there are, there are more obstacles to it at, at the front end, and not just at the front end. There's a kind of constant conversation where there's doubt or suspicion. There's less reflexive um, generosity towards the idea that one is going to find more than one is bringing uh, in, in in these kinds of explorations. And again, for us, this is you know this is in a very particular environment where we're, at, we're asking students day after day to wrestle with such fundamental things through the study of philosophy constantly, literature constantly, but also foundational text and mathematics and natural science and so on. But the, the kind of vulnerability that we're asking for is never easy. I think it's harder in this, in, in this environment. Um, we do have to talk about it more. I think we also have to, you know, I, I directed it faculty too, sometimes there can be a sense that, well, that's the student's problem. They just need to, mm -hmm. they just need to catch up. You know, we, we, we know it still works, and we, we've told them that if they're not prepared to take the plunge. But I don't consider that to be consistent with the spirit of, of liberal education. I, I view what Socrates did as always going to some starting point that he could find in his interlocutor. I think that's what we have to do as educators. Sometimes those are starting points that, that we find hostile to our own enterprise. But if that's where the student is, we begin there, and then we try to 
we try to get the conversation to move us together to, to some third place that you know, we, we can't anticipate. Okay, thank you. Um, since today we're trying to think about education in its, in its full scope, I wanna ask um, Walter, starting with you, to talk about why those, the um, architects of the unique curriculum and program that St. John's now has decided that undergraduate education need to be, needed to be separated from graduate education. Some of the people involved in the founding moment, that refounding moment rather, um, that instituted the new program had actually been involved at the, been part of the University of Chicago, most notably um, Robert Maynard Hutchins, president of the University of Chicago, eventually went to St. John's to serve as head of the board, right? So some people moved from one institution to the other and we're thinking in particularly about this idea that collegiate education should um, have a kind of integrity of its own and that might need a separate institution. So why is that? And what distinguishes collegiate education from graduate education? I'd, I'd, uh, I'd be a poor steward as dean if I didn't point out that we do have uh, a couple yeah, of graduate, graduate, graduate programs, programs at St. John's and, and in our audience, I see two of our deans for graduate programs. Uh, we, we have a, a couple of master's degrees that we offer mm -hmm. the college that are very much like our, our undergraduate program con conceptually. Um, so maybe, let me and they're wonderful opportunities for uh, yeah. for, for Let me rephrase folks. that. I think I wasn't no, no, accurate. No, no, I, I, a research university. Yeah, yes. Still no, not no, a research no, 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 university, just, right? So you have <clears throat> graduate programs. As far, I'm somewhat familiar with yes, those, and I should have no. thought of that, but they are kind of extensions of yeah. the undergraduate program. They're yeah. conducted in the same, mm -hmm. same manner yeah. and the same spirit, right? No, absolutely. I just I was just taking my 30 seconds no, there you. to <laughs> celebrate our master's programs. So, you know, in the simplest terms, I think what those educational philosophers were wrestling with, at least the ones that finally landed it at St. John's Bar in Buchanan and, and Hutchins to some degree, but the, the deep concern that the, the project of liberal education of a, a, a generally educated human being uh, uh, that's especially needed, in their view, in a, a modern liberal democracy was actually being completely squeezed out by the, uh, by the radical extension of the European research university model into all areas of education, really all areas, but specifically swallowing up the, the undergraduate college uh, through the electives and majors and so on, departmentalization. So where is there going to be the space for the holistic project of, and a lot of us might not like the word project, but the, the holistic project of becoming the generally liberally educated human being? <clears throat> so I, I don't think any of them thought that uh, doctoral programs and graduate schools and so on should go away but what they radicalized at St. John's was a commitment to having an institution that was just about that, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and, that, and that took the form of not having graduate schools, not having departments. You know, I, I often say what we ask our students to do, an integrated four-year interdisciplinary great books program, there's more that we could say about it, that's radical and unusual, and uh, many disciples turn away that day when they, when they, when they hear that. But what we do with our faculty is even more radical to not be departmentalized and to ask them to go on this journey across all the, the, the texts, all the areas that we do, not as professors, but as tutors, as fellow learners and Socratic guides with deep reservoirs of learning, but not in every area that they're gonna be teaching. Uh, so that, you know, that, was, that was the view that the temptation to balkanize learning in the university model and the research model that that's, in a certain sense, the antithesis of what liberal education re requires. And so they created this kind of fenced garden uh, as, uh, you know, as a way of uh, uh, allowing one form of uh, full liberal education to, to flourish. Now, all our faculty come with, with PhDs, most in the humanities, some in other disciplines, there are so many ways in which we need all those reservoirs of learning so there can be a little bit of disingenuousness to it if you, if you make mm -hmm. it sound too Manichaean. I wouldn't at all, but I fully accept and think we see today, you know, and through multiple generations, some of the weaknesses of um, uh, allowing undergraduate education to become so, um, uh, uh, so diffuse 
uh, so much a matter of uh, choice, specialization, vocationalization, um, probably now more than then consumerism in a way. You're, you're putting mm -hmm. together the product you want uh, from all these different areas. <clears throat> what I often say, say to young people is you can get a liberal education, just about any institu institution of higher education in this country, but you're going to have to fight for it, kind of carve it out of the institution. The institution isn't inviting you into it or giving it a shape. And, and at St. John's, it's more like a, a, a train you can't get out of the, 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 the way of. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's it inevitable. Will, so. It will hit you. Um, Amanda, yeah, reflections so on so this. It's so interesting to think about the historical mm -hmm. connections yeah. between our institutions. And so I, 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 I might not make the different the distinction between undergraduate and graduate education, but m rather general education and more specialized education at the University of Chicago, we have the we have the core. Um, and it's um, it's uh, typically students do it in the first two years. And I'm looking at the new dean of the college at the University of Chicago, Melina Hale, who has the um, really wonderful and super challenging job of, of taking the reins from John Boyer, who's been the dean uh, since uh, before I ever came to the University of Chicago. And um, so there we we try the balance between um, having um, a core that, as you described, engages students in big questions in their first days at the university um, across broad fields taught by interdisciplinary teams of faculty. Um, and then uh, the specialization of masters. And if you look at how the core and undergraduate programming has changed over time, that balance is a has been a challenging one. I, I think it's a, a good one. And I've been reflecting lately, because, um, in part because John Boyer is, is leaving the deanship, about how very important that aspect of the college, the core, is for intellectual life broadly at the University of Chicago. Um, so research professors teach in the core. We all have to. It's in our contract that we must. And, um, and so we teach together with people from different disciplines on questions that are big <laughs> and not necessarily the questions at the heart of our own you know, particular research uh, project of the moment. Um, and what that does for us is it keeps conversations across disciplines very robust. University of Chicago is a place where we always talk about our low walls. They really are low, and I think the core is a big reason for that, a big contributor to that. And it also helps um, all of us keep the big questions in view in our own work. I think my own research has been affected and enlivened and guided by having to return back to big questions like, you know, what, what is knowledge? Do we perceive reality veridically? What is that? Like these are these are deep questions that students leave Cobb Hall and begin talking about and stay up all night, and they and they enliven um, um, my work as well. And I expect that's true for lots of lots of my colleagues. Yeah. Can, can I follow up there? Just uh, yeah. that that way you put it, and and we were chatting a little bit about this before. It you know it se it seems to me to really shine a light. I think in this kind of conversation, we're, we're often often appropriately focused on the student and what we think education is for the student. But it, it shines a light on, on the faculty. And I, and I guess I would say the vocation of being an academic, the vocation of being a faculty member. And, and I don't think anybody, any place, any model has a monopoly on all the goods and no weaknesses. I, I would say at St. John's, we've set up a very eccentric uh, community and incentive structure where the faculty who are called to be there, they're, they're all in on sitting around the table with students and learning and reading together and being teachers in that very close sense, but, but also doing it with things they've never studied before and so on. It's, it's, there's a real sense of calling to that. But there are costs and sacrifices to it, and I could enumerate those. What I hear you saying is that Chicago, you see a balance that's been set up in the, in the way faculty are expected, both to do their research and to participate in this. And, and, and that seems like a powerful model. We might agree that some of higher ed is set up where the incentives are so powerful for pulling faculty away yeah. from the project yeah. of something like core undergraduate teaching. Yeah. And it's fine to say that, that all these things can exist in the ecosystem of higher education, but, but many of the things that we might perceive as crises or erosion in higher education, I think, suggest uh, looking at incentive structures on the one hand and kind of deep reflections about what, what is the calling of being a, a, a professor, uh, a teacher, 
uh, a steward of uh, what we're trying to do in our colleges and universities. And understanding that any, any way we set it up, there might be a drift, a natural drift or erosion in, in yeah. one direction or another that's going to require some, some tending uh, uh, to keep that, that, that balance or to strike that balance or forge it anew when it's... Uh, uh, when it's when it's slipped. Absolutely, I think it's a constant. It's it's a constant. And and Melina, you you have this now as part of your charge, right? To keep the core vital in a research university, where faculty are very rightly pulled um, to the demand of of keeping their you know making their research at at the top of their game, right? Um, mm -hmm. And every everybody that we hire, so it's a piece of my job is hiring new faculty, mm -hmm. explaining to them why written in your contract is that you will teach. Uh, in, in, in the core. Um, they come from places where that isn't a tradition. So it definitely is work um, of me, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we're talking about walls between the disciplines. I want to turn to a different, yeah. different kind of wall, the, the wall between the university and the outside world. So um, I want to ask in particular what you see, how you see the relation between elite colleges and universities like St. John's and the University of Chicago, they educate only a tiny fraction mm -hmm. of the American population, and yet they receive uh, a lot of attention um, and a lot of, and they're the subject of intense debate, not your institutions in particular, but elite institutions yeah. as such, yeah. particularly now. So Amanda, do you think this kind of attention to education is overblown, or does it actually make some sense? How do you see the reciprocal relationship, if there is one, between a place like the University of Chicago and the world beyond its gates? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's a kind of challenge that um, universities are thinking about. You know, I know the University of Chicago is thinking about it. And our new president, Paul Alavisados, is thinking a great deal about. Bob Zimmer, before him, thought a great deal about. Um, how do you, what is the impact of, of a university? Certainly the people you teach, and we teach more undergraduates now than, than when you were with us, so you know, we do more of that. Um, and we teach an awful lot of graduate students and master's students and PhD students, professional school students. But how, how do you get beyond that? One, uh, one way, and the University of Chicago is not unique in this, is finding ways to directly reach students from beyond your walls. So, most many universities, the University of Chicago included, have summer programs where high school students from around the world and around the country come. Or uh, the University of Chicago just instituted a new MOU with the city colleges in Chicago to share curricular materials and approaches across. Um, we have a new program uh, that we're just launching called Economics for Everyone that has the very bold ambition of taking um, the wonderful goods we have in economic ideas and education at the University of Chicago and bringing them to high school students, to international students, to broad audiences. Um, so those kinds of efforts, I think, are really important. We have another program we for a long time have had, the Graham School, which offers non-degree uh, courses. Um, and we are expanding that. The new dean of the Grand School has a program called the Leadership and Society Initiative that is um, there for people who are at maybe an inflection point late in their careers want to come back and spend a year engaging with faculty. So those kinds of programs that are just reaching, you know, how, how can you reach more people with what we do, I think are, are really important. The challenge as they get bigger and bigger is to have the, to have the experience, to have the core still there. Right, um, and that's a challenge when you have a limited number of faculty. Um, and you know, how how do you make sure that the that the not just the ideas are making it, but the approach to ideas? What we were talking about before, how how the understanding of how how knowledge is gleaned. Are, are you are you conveying that? Um, so I think that's that's a an important challenge. And then of course. The other way that institutions can have broader effects is, is like what happened with the Chicago principles, that you can, if you, to the extent that um, university leaders um, can um, articulate um, in, in ways, in messaging that can, that can inspire conversations outside the walls, I think that's a really important project as well. Yeah, I, I think there's so many di different directions one can go with this question. I spent a lot of time, time thinking about that. I mean, the first thing I, that, that I want to say is that the, the heterogeneity of institutions in American higher education yeah. is a hu huge strength. And, yeah. and I assume there are many people in this room that, that um, share that view. And so sometimes, 
you know, at St. John's, we, we think of ourselves as, in part, as a small liberal arts college, national liberal arts college. We well, can go look at you know, US News list of their 50 or 100, 300 others of those. But sometimes I'll do a list where I think uh, you know, we're so eccentric. Really, the list is, is us and the military academies and single sex education and uh, thoroughgoing religious uh, colleges and universities. That, you know, there, there's this range of uh, flora and fauna in higher ed. And I'm, I'm always sorry when that uh, species biodiversity contracts. Uh, and it has over time. And, it's, and it, you know, to the degree to which we prognosticate, it seems like it will con continue to do so. And that seems like a loss. And, and you know, that could be interrogated. Why? Why not figure out the right model or the best model and just have everything start to converge towards that? But I think there are countless reasons why that's not the right way to think about um, what college education can and needs to do uh, in, in a, a large nation, in a pluralistic democracy, in a place where you want institutions to be responsive to particular communities, local communities, and so on. So heterogeneity, let's, let's keep it uh, diverse and, and rich. Um, the other thought that I have is that some of these, I mean, you said elite, and I don't know, that's not a term we usually apply to ourselves, but uh, the, the small elite institutions, and I would say this about the liberal arts colleges generally, which do seem to be an American innovation, once almost all religious, right, that's, you know, that's a huge change over time, but that, uh, uh, that the liberal arts colleges keep the universities honest. And what do I mean by that? We're, we're only educating a small fraction of students, but we're showing that there is a way to do a four-year undergraduate education that's still committed to the ideals that I drone on about of liberal education and you know, general education in, in all things, preparation uh, uh, to be a fully flourishing human being. You had wonderful phrases on that in your introduction, Jenna. We show that it's still possible, practical, actual to have communities that are relatively dedicated to that and that then send their graduates out to all the things in life and all the paths and success. And I think that makes the larger universities in a certain way compete for sustaining that as some part of, of, of what they do. At least I'd like to believe that. Um, a third thing I would say about a place like St. John's, and, and I, you know, again, I think it's true of some other very eccentric or unique institutions, we have an outsized impact that goes beyond the relatively few graduates we send out in, in the world each year. First of all, in a lot of ways, we, we think we teach the teachers. Um, it's kind of been a longstanding path from, from St. John's for our undergraduates, for our master's students, uh, for educators elsewhere to look to St. John's uh, as, as a kind of model uh, we, we have so many alumni working in classical school education, uh, charter school education, in the homeschool movement, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, one, it's just one part of the pie, you might say, but it's one that seems very natural and organic to, to what we're doing. And, and I think it's true of a place like University of Chicago. You teach our teachers. We have, we have more faculty that, that uh, come from the University of Chicago uh, graduate programs than any other institution. Uh, so I think teaching the teachers and, and generating paradigms that, that ripple through education K through 12 and higher has been one of the, the things that the smaller elite or eccentric uh, in institutions uh, have done. Then the last thing I want to say is it, it is preparation for citizenship. And we, you know, we, we wrestle with that in the context of talking about liberal arts, liberal education, and we're probably gonna come back to this. You know, some folks wanna argue orienting towards that and all the more towards career preparation is the phrase I sometimes use is playing on somebody else's home court, especially the career preparation side and that we're about these higher ideals. I don't view those as, as either or, and it's certainly the case, certainly the case that the founders of our program were obsessed with what they viewed as the crisis of modern democracy and mass society. And the only way this adventure that we're on is not going to collapse uh, completely into one sort of dystopia or another is through a robust, liberally educated citizenry. And I don't think we should back off from that one bit. Uh, 
I don't want to have to stand behind every civic action of every graduate that we put out in the, in the world. And, uh, but, but I do believe, uh, uh, in the main, what I just said at our graduation last week, that our, our alumni are going to go out and do everything. And it's not about doing this or that, but they're going to be the, the exceptionally thoughtful, articulate, and humane this or that. And we need more of that, not less. And I, and I don't know how you get it. In fact, I think it's very hard to get it except through the crucible of a genuine uh, liberal education. So Walter, you're making the point here at the end mm -hmm. that um, colleges and universities have, in many cases, conceived of themselves as educating citizens, mm -hmm. as playing a crucial role in the, in the preservation and advancement of, mm -hmm. of democracy and life in our, in, in our democratic republic. Mm -hmm. So how should we think about um, the what's happening now in the world where the universities and political life meet, right? So if sometimes one sees these kinds of uh, arguments arising in this way, people from outside the university, whether they be trust as close as trustees or state legislatures who are responsible for public universities, sometimes the federal government, are making the point that the universities aren't doing what they think is necessary for political life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes faculty say, just leave us alone, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're saying that, no, universities have often thought of themselves as preparing citizens, how do they deal with the critique from the broader political world that we don't think you're doing that in the right way, in general? I'm not talking specifically mm -hmm. about St. John's, mm -hmm. of course, but generally in higher education, what? or Chicago. I, I can start. If, yeah, right. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's perfectly appropriate for us to be held accountable uh, to the world. I, I, I don't understand. Um, I mean, look, I want our students and faculty to be, I sometimes use this phrase, you know, insulated from the hot breath of the present. Uh, you know, I, I think bringing that hot breath right to the seminar table when we're trying to learn is not advantageous to, to that seminar. And I don't want to see speakers shouted down. I, I don't want to see books banned, et cetera. But uh, we don't get to live in another world to do that. We live in this world, and, and all one needs to do is, is you know, look at Socrates or read Aristophanes' Clouds or any other, or study the life of Confucius or any other origin point of uh, liberal learning and free inquiry. And there's always got to be some way in which the, the, the teachers and the thinkers uh, uh, hold themselves accountable to the powers that, that be. Now, I think if, if you believe this as I do, you can hope that liberal democracy is the one regime that in its own principles is favorable <laughs> to the freedom of the life of the mind. And there's a kind of... Uh, symbiosis there, whereas maybe every other regime, there's a profound tension, arguably. But even if there's uh, an affinity there, um, it's still got to be maintained and sustained. And that's partly rhetorical, but it's, it's genuine. Our license to operate in the fullest sense uh, is only through persuading right, the larger polity that we are a healthy part of that healthy polity. And I think we ought to be able and willing to do that. Now, the, the flashpoint issues that often make us, I think, appropriately cringe because it looks like you know, bad stuff is coming onto our campus one way or the other, I guess even there, I try to, um, and, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, it's easier in hindsight. I, I, in hindsight, I would say most of the things that we would look at as times of a cultural upheaval that have generated something like academic culture wars, that's good for us. That's good for us because those are the kinds of arguments and questions and so on. And again, you said this in your introduction, I believe, that mean people are taking seriously that the books we read, that what happens on our campuses, what happens in our classrooms matters. Uh, and um, maybe it's just a way for me to be able to saddle up each day, but I'm trying to look at, at everything about the current moment that, that way as well. And I think it's true of liberal education that the things that in a way are its greatest challenges, um, the greatest challenges to the life of the mind, to, to philosophy, to free inquiry, are also the greatest spurs and goads and fuel and opportunity for, 
for liberal education and, and for those things. So it's got to be managed. I mean, nobody's, um, you know, we, we can't dig a moat. We can't build a wall high enough. We're carried on the same waves that more than ever because of our, our complete connectivity and the noisy world that we're in. We're carried on the same waves as the rest of society. And I think that's the, the, the privilege and duty uh, of educators is to be able to make uh, a case, um, to be able to make a case. Not, you're not gonna win it with the least good faith critics on any side of any spectrum. You're still gonna have to engage with them, uh, but you've gotta view yourself as having the, the ability and the opportunity to persuade uh, the, the, the good faith sincere, authentic challenges that come from the, the center of, of the polity, uh, I think. That's, I guess that's where I would start. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic answer. I think that's right in what you said earlier about the heterogeneity of kinds of institutions, that each institution, because of its charter and framing, has its own set of stakeholders and interlocutors. The University of Chicago, we, we pride ourselves on being very faculty driven and the trustees adopt, I think, the, the stance in accord with that. Um, I wanted to comment on, you talked about the hot breath, trying to keep the hot breath away and the moat and the walls. And I think at the University of Chicago, we don't, we don't do that. This is an interesting difference between our institutions. So we all the time have students who want to protest something, who disagree about a class that's being taught. We don't like that class. And that, that happens from all, all, all possible political positions. There could be disagreements. Um, what, we, what we do, and I think we manage it pretty well, is we help students understand and, and work through appropriate forms of expression of that disagreement so that you don't get it in the way, right? So we had this past year in my division two classes that where students objected to the, the content and teacher of the class um, from completely different ends of the political spectrum and adopting different strategies for doing it. In both cases, those classes were taught with full complements of students and no disruption in the classroom. Um, in one case, there were students with placards outside the building where the class was being taught. Um, so we do a lot of work as an institution to manage that, um, to, to have the hot breath with us, but, but use it as a way to teach students um, about the values of preserving free expression and how we can have disagreement um, at the same time that we have um, open expression. Yeah. Thank you. So last question for me until yeah. before, rather, I open it to, uh, to you all for questions for Amanda and Walter. Um, you've each supervised the education of hundreds, if not thousands, of students. And in your role as deans, you're called upon to reflect what fosters and hinders the education of, of those in your charge. Mm -hmm. So our question for the conference, what is education? What is the image that guides your efforts? So you How do you know if you've if you've done, it. done what you were supposed to do for your student, <laughs> or your institution has done what it's supposed to do for its yeah. graduates. So, so you, in your introduction, you, I think you gave my definition of education. Okay. So, because I studied my my work is on how children um, and and infants learn from other people, um, the very earliest stages of learning, and we are a species that that is born needing to be educated. That's part of that. That's our magic as a species, right? Um, we we need to be educated in that. We need to learn from people who know more than us about stuff, about facts, but also about ways of engaging appropriately with other people in the world. And that if we don't get that education from the start, then we don't develop into um, you know, fully functioning adults or even partially functioning adults. So, um, so that in, in broad terms, I see that as, as what education is. And of course, formal education has its own um, qualities and the kind of education that happens at, at colleges and universities, what we've been, just been discussing it. It is uh, um, just that same profile um, around particular sets of practices and engagements with other people um, that are sort of the, the critical foundation um, for being a person who can think critically and analytically and somebody who can go beyond their experience um, in important ways. And then how do, we, how do you know you've done it? That's super hard. I don't, I, I'm not aware of it, but maybe, maybe others are aware of whether there's some kind of uh, data one could gather. But I, I tend to 
think about it through um, what it's like to teach students. Um, you know, you have the experience of, of you know, giving an exam or having a term paper or having a conversation with a student where it becomes clear to you that they have learned something. It's, mag it's, it's tremendously reinforcing when that, and that happens a fair amount of the time. And not that they've, um, acquired, that they've learned uh, an important set of, of conceptual tools um, and that maybe they've become able to use them creatively. Um, I see that routinely in students, all students, all levels of students that I teach. Um, and then the other place I see it is because, and you probably are this way too, a big piece of my job is going around and talking to alumni lately. Um, and University of Chicago alumni are to a person, um, and there, there are several of them around, will say um, that the University of Chicago is where they learn to think. And part of what they mean by that is um, that they, they um, got to study with, with an important thinker. They acquired important knowledge in a discipline or a set of analytic tools. But another piece of what they mean is that they learned um, about um, the kinds of conversation and discourse that give rise um, to new knowledge. Beautiful reflections there. You know, I'm getting more relaxed over the hour, and I'm biting my tongue on uh, comical answers about rising yeah. in the rankings or net tuition <laughs> revenue or something as the as, as the key indices. Of, uh, I, you know, I, I mean, you mentioned metaphors, and I I think of gardening and agricultural metaphors. So I'll, I mean, I'll just say that because mm -hmm. it matters to me to say it's to me it's something like cultivation of uh, a, a plant, something like uh, pruning and nurturing growth, um, and also something like scattering seeds, the fruit of which you may never see. I mean, I think that's the fate of educators everywhere is this sense of the, the fruit coming later and, and often in, in visit. I mean, you discover yeah. it. You end up seeing it here and there, but you, you have a kind of faith that if you keep scattering these seeds. But, but what matters to me about that metaphor is um, uh, what, you know, what I see as, uh, as being at the heart of why we exist as uh, a liberal arts college, why that, why that vision um, should animate us is there's, there, there, there's human nature and it longs to, to realize itself. We, um, you know, all human beings by nature desire to know uh, as, as Aristotle starts the metaphysics and I think it's, it's that natural longing and that natural potential that we're that we're nurturing, and it's important to view it as nurturing something that's beyond us, lest we view it as a kind of artifact that we're manufacturing. Um, but that's that that's so that's the that's the vision that I have. Our college seal says in Latin that I make free adults uh, from children by means of books and a balance, which again, hopefully, is an ideal held by many everywhere. But that view of the free adult, that the college education or becoming educated is a kind of passage from uh, a, 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 a state of immaturity and lack of freedom and independence into a fullness of, of being a free adult. And that means a certain kind of degree of perfection of our faculties, rational and, and otherwise. So, so that's what I think we're about. <clears throat> it, it, it admits of degree, thank God. It's not. It's not yes or no. It's lifelong, but that's the project. That's the work uh, attending that and trying to see it blossom enough on the dais at commencement that you you've launched into the world, uh, educated human beings of of that sort. And then I, I think Amanda gave texture to that that was that, that was very eloquent. But that's that's the vision that I think about uh, that motivates me. Okay. Thank you. Let me open it up now to uh, the floor for questions. So, Jackie Merrill. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ground my question in a text, um, which I think is appropriate for the uh, Oh, nice. oh. Thank you very much. And I'll just say I'm Jackie Pfeffer Merrill. I'm the director of the Campus Free Expression Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And as part of that work, I'm very familiar with the, the Chicago principles. And I'm going to just make it appear a little bit bigger for me. Um, so one of my favorite sentences from the whole Chicago statements really picks up on something that Walter said, that now it's more important to kind of cultivate those skills of conversations among students. And the Chicago statement says, fostering the ability of members of the university community 
to engage in such debate and deliberation in an effective and responsible manner is an essential part of the university's educational mission. And you spoke into the successes of you know, students protesting, the classes, uh, but I, and you're both deans, so I know you speak the language of assessment, but I, I would like to hear a little bit more about how you carry out this essential part of the educational mission and, and how you know you've succeeded. Great, well I, I can say a bit, although I am tempted to turn it over to the dean of the college to talk about what she does, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I think there's, um, Walter, some of what you were saying earlier sort of makes the point that there isn't. This is a this is the this is work that happens at many levels and in many ways simultaneously. I think one one piece is just having sustaining the culture you have at a place that you have um, faculty who will. Um, um, engage a classroom in particular ways. Those faculty, the way you learn, a big way you learn to teach at the University of Chicago is you're a new professor and you teach in the core with your colleagues and you get enculturated that way. And that, in my experience, and I think a lot of people's, affects how you how you then engage in teaching afterwards. Um, one of the um, first events that undergraduates have on campus at the University of Chicago is called the Aims of Education Address. Everybody gathers in Rockefeller Chapel, um, and a faculty speaker is selected who talks, uh, who gives their reflections on, you know, what what they think the aims of education are. So they they each have a particular um, set of, you know insights that they bring to that. Um, and then following that, the students leave and immediately go into small discussion sessions with a faculty member to talk about the address, to digest it, to argue about it. So it's sort of like a first, you've been on campus a couple of days and this is one of your first experiences, right? Um, there's all kinds of other programming. Um, and, um, and as we work through challenges, I think those are teachable moments too um, for students. Um, there is something called the Parasia program, which offers a lot of um, um, uh, uh, co-curricular activities around this that students participate in. Um, so I think there, there are many angles to it. And how do you know? Um, I think actually one way we know is when we see it working, when the students who wanted to hold the placards in front of the class that was being taught in Cobb Hall, as it happens, um, they, they, um, they, they knew what to do. They didn't think that they should interrupt what was happening in the classroom. They didn't have to be told that. They knew it. They knew that they knew how they could voice their opinion. So you, you see those successes. Yeah. You wanna? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I think I'll just pick up on yeah. on on the last thing to say. I, I for us uh, as uh, seminar leaders at St. John's, what we think we see is the freshmen come in and they start arguing and, and talking at each other, and then just over four years, right, they end up in, in such a different place. And it's largely ag acculturation, habituation. It's not that there's a playbook that they learn and memorize, but every day they're getting nudges and cues, and they're finding, uh, they're discovering that more comes from that collegial uh, approach and from becoming self-critical and listening and so on. Uh, we do much more than we used to with orientation and uh, discussions. I mean, sometimes I just call them all sort of meta discussions about what we're doing. We do much more of that. And I think that's important. It's important that that gives them handholds. It gives them some account. It makes them realize that there are challenges and questions that people might raise that we've thought about and we have some answers for. But I really think they, they learn by doing it and finding where the richness is. In, um, in being open to things coming from very different uh, places than your own. That said, there's, you know, there's another part of that continent where I think some of our students, even ones who succeed, feel like all of that is a kind of pious account that still defends us from or inoculates certain kinds of challenges that ought to have purchased that we find a way of, uh, of, of kind of refereeing out. And, and I, you know, I'm maybe more willing to say that than, than some of my colleagues, but I, I think I see that still. There's, you know, there's, no, there's no view from nowhere, and there's no presuppositionless curriculum. And uh, some of our students and colleagues come from places that, um, make it appear to them from day one and on their last day that we've skewed things sort of systematically for 
you know, not maybe not intentionally, but um, and and you know they're not persuaded by our defenses, but they benefit from being there, and I think they'd say that too. And maybe we all are in a little bit of that place of same and other with any curriculum and educational community. And I think that again is part of the the challenge. I you know I, I think liberal education I'll sometimes say is education without a net. Right, it can't be what it wants to be if it's ensuring against any of the risks that are going to come from uh, talking about ultimate things and the you know the greatest works of the human mind and spirit. So, so trying to manage that while accepting that the the, the very range of human freedom means we don't have an account or a playbook that's going to satisfy everyone. Let's try to let's try to find the common ground that allows us to learn together, even with that dissent and. And even then, right, it's not going to be something everybody can, can find their way into. Karen Tugendhoff. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those presentations. Um, so by nature, I'm inclined to agree with everything that both of you have said. And so um, I'm going to try and push myself to a position other than that, right? In, uh, and. I see, it seems to me that the type of education you guys are, that you're both talking about, right, it really works well with people who um, have a kind of curiosity, right, um, and it start, starting to position of curiosity. But I wonder, you know, uh, about a different type of starting point that people can have, which is that of anger. Um, you know, you see uh, today a lot of times the, the refrain in certain circles at least, right, if, um, if you're not angry, then you're not paying attention, right? Um, and there's a lot of encouragement. And I would say probably on, quote, unquote, both sides, that there's an encouragement to, to anger. Um, and I wonder, what, what do you do as educators or, and, and, and advocating this kind of education um, with that anger? Is, is somebody who has anger simply not right for this type of education? And um, is there a way to... Uh, use that anger, re redirect it, right? There, there's so, there, how do you deal with uh, people who don't think that our status quo, right, is a healthy polity, right? Um, and that therefore I want to be properly uh, educated into being a member of that healthy polity, but think that the polity is fundamentally rotten and uh, with anger wants to tear it all down. Um, yeah. That's a hard question. So, you know, I think I, I, um, may, maybe we're helped by the fact that I think people are, are multi-dimensional, even angry people. Um, and, um, and if you can find out, um, you know, what's underneath the anger, maybe it's a sense of having a feeling excluded or that opportunities haven't been open. Well, we can all agree that having open opportunities is an important thing, right? So I, so I think, and maybe I'm being overly rosy, but I'm, I don't think I am. And I, and I think when you have students or um, younger people who come to a campus who have a kind of anger, under, understanding or challenging them to, to articulate what's underneath it can be helpful. Um, yeah. And, and, it, and the world is, we're not perfect. There are things that we can improve. And so, you know, sort of understanding that as a project that, that we could think about together can be helpful. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all that. I, I think I want to challenge you a little bit at, at, at the outset. You said this works with people who, I forget how exactly you said it, but who are by nature curious or being guided by their curiosity. But, you know, what if, what if they're instead being guided by anger, which I think is the great, affliction of our time. I think it's one way to describe it. Uh, I think we are collectively angrier and, and divided, and that has to do with a lot of things. But in the most generous way, it has to do with deep divisions about what, what justice is, what, what the healthy polity is. But can't you be both? Uh, uh, you know, I, I think we're all by nature curious. I, I think young people especially are curious. So, and I think this, this is a version of what I heard uh, Amanda saying, the way to bring them in is not to say, I'm going to talk you out of your anger and the principles that are driving it and the convictions that are, that are driving it, and that's got to be the precondition for your entering this in good faith. You've got to somehow go at it 
indirectly, you've got to capitalize on their curiosity uh, and the other things that might draw them towards this kind of education. And then I do think it's a kind of sleight of hand. I think that if the education works, they'll become less, less angry. Um, I, I do believe that. Um, uh, and, and maybe people will, will challenge that. But as you, know, as you well know, the, the, the Western education, we can talk about whether to start with Athens or start with Jerusalem, but the first word that our students read is the wrath that is the first word of the Iliad. And Achilles' anger is not unlike the anger that's everywhere today. And uh, just after four good seminars on the Iliad, without realizing it, our freshmen have come to understand a great deal about the roots of rage and the way in which uh, one's demands for justice and, and one's own desserts can actually you know, shatter your whole world and the things you love. And, and that journey begins, and, and in a way it never, it never ends if they take up these books and, and questions. And uh, so I think there's a therapy for what most uh, uh, troubles us, but you're right that if, if people have to explicitly check the things that they think they care most about as, you know, as a kind of entry point. So I think it has to be, it has to be worked out and worked through. But if there's not the underlying curiosity or love for something that's pulling them into it, then they're not going to start. But I think that's very universal. And certainly we should give young people especially the benefit of the doubt but also give every human the benefit of the doubt that, that, that's, that that's in them. Uh, and they've really got to show us uh, through extended stubborn resistance, and some pull that off, uh, that, that, those, that, that those natural uh, tendrils aren't, aren't in there. Okay. Carol Quillen, you have a question? Thank you both so much for um, coming, and thanks, Jenna, for organizing it. Um, as a Chicago grad who did, in fact, learn to think at the University of Chicago, I'm always grateful to be reminded of how much I owe that institution. Um, my question is, um, you know, uh, and this is in part inspired by having been at Chicago recently and understanding how the core has changed over time. It's not the core. The core's not the same as it was a gazillion years ago when I was there. Um, and, and the thinking about the if it's possible to talk about liberal education as a philosophy of education, right? That's about developing talents and capacities so that humans can fulfill their potential, remain curious learners for the rest of their lives, become productive democratic citizens, independent of the specific disciplines or texts through which you develop those capacities. And I think institutions have different views of that. My sense is that in public debate, um, our inability to talk about liberal education in part as a philosophy uh, leads people to, who would otherwise be supportive of it to be very critical of it um, because they see it as impractical, right? So you see, why should you, you know, I don't know, major in anthropology, what kind of job are you gonna get? And it also alienates people who think you're simply defending like the Western civilization class that I took. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not being very clear. So that there's a way in which, there would be a way to talk about liberal education that would build a broad consensus for its value in a very divided public if we focus on it as a philosophy explicitly and don't allow people to assume what we're talking about is a particular set of great books, which believe me, I love, or something that's anti-careerist. Does that make any sense mm -hmm. at all? You guys are looking at me like, maybe, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts about that? Because it sounds like you were both, I mean, I don't think that's about the text that are important, but it does sound like you're talking about something that as knowledge expands and there are new mm -hmm. fields that emerge, yeah. it's not impossible to develop a, a liberal education that includes those new fields. Mm -hmm. and, and when we don't, when we're not explicit about that, I think we sacrifice a lot of public support for what we collectively are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And the core at the University of Chicago has been through many 
iterations, and there was a there was a, 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 a you know a branching point where a piece went off and developed. It was um, so, um, it, and we were both of us just at an event where where there was a discussion about the core, and all of us who teach in the core had to reflect on what is the core, <laughs> um, and it is definitely I mean it's it's across fields, and it's you know it's it's organized around general. So there's a set of social science offerings, a set of humanities offerings, physical sciences, biological sciences, mathematics, and those things are. You know, all students have to traverse through it, but they don't traverse through it, unlike at St. John's, through the same set of readings. So there are common syllabi within a sequence that we're all, all the faculty in a sequence are teaching the same things. There are many classic works, um, but there are also contemporary works. Um, and, and the uh, core sequence I teach in is called Mind. Um, and it goes from, you know, sort of thinking about basic ways of understanding what is, what is human thought, perception, emotion, to like what's the latest neuroscience, is there a way that we can help you know, first year students understand some of the insights you might get from those approaches? Um, so I think what, um, what sort of characterizes the core is the big questions and the idea that primary texts and old texts as well as new texts inform our thinking about that um, is, is, the, is what works. But it's a different, I mean, we just have different, there are different ways to do it. There's not one, one right approach, I think. I I agree with what you said. I, I think, it, I mean, at the heart of your question, the idea of articulating the ends and benefits and skills and so on, kind of detached from a certain uh, curriculum, texts, maybe even a kind of taxonomy of arts or arts and sciences or liberal arts. Uh, it, I think, I think that, I think we do that all the time in in stating some of the benefits. Uh, I think, if anything, the evolution of the liberal arts broadly, the humanities broadly, is, is more that diffusion than it is clinging, right? If we just look at American higher education, um, uh, it's not that it's stayed static. It's really that it's, that it's you know, if anything, it, it feels too superficial because it's run out in so many rivulets. But, but at a deeper level, and this is something, and I, I, I thought about this, my gardening and agricultural metaphor, what, what it misses is the idea that liberal education is also somehow the between past and future of inheriting a tradition and being part of a living tradition. We use in our statement of the program the language of our shared intellectual heritage. Now, once you start talking that way, it's very contestable, right? What's excluded, what's included. Yeah. I think we have to be willing to have those conversations. Uh, but you know, to use the Matthew Arnold phrase, the best of what's been thought and said. I don't. I don't think you can. So we can, we can discuss what should be in there. <clears throat> Most people want to keep Shakespeare in there, and what else should go in with Shakespeare? It's you know, it's a question. But, uh, um, but I, I don't think liberal education works if it doesn't also feel some kind of backward-looking fidelity to what it's to the to the. The, the, the matter of, of thought and speech and art and science that we inherit, that we're somehow uh, putting ourselves in, into a free relationship with, that also means critiquing it and so on. So I, I think it's tough. I mean, I, I, again, we always are doing it. These benefits, these, what you're calling kind of philosophy of liberal education, it feels too thin to me. It's like it's looking at one, mm -hmm. one hemisphere and missing the other hemisphere. When you go to the other hemisphere, a lot of controversy comes in, and we have to be willing to in mm -hmm. engage with that. And I, you know, I think we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I agree with that com completely. And at St. John's, we don't, you're never going to find the word canon in, in any of our materials. Mm -hmm. We don't view it as a fixed set. There's an abundance of what we could do, and it's important that that always be contestable. Uh, that said, right, many of us, and I among them, think that some of the things that are viewed as the as the cutting critiques of the text and authors that that do look like they hold their place, I think, are mistaken and have to be rebutted. That's very different than talking about the other things that could be included and and how things evolve and, and so on. Nathaniel Peters. So I have a question about whether you perceive a generational shift um, in terms of views of both the methods and content of liberal education. 
my sense is that people in my generation and younger are the locus of the protest and the questioning and the sort of activism against both, you know, you could say the sort of the teaching of great texts and also kind of the, the ways that you've spoken about it. So not only the idea of core curricula and what has traditionally been in core curricula, but the idea that disciplines like musicology or classics or even just the question of merit in the empirical sciences, um, the questioning of all of that tends to come from uh, people who aren't in the seats of power yet, but who in 20 to 40 years are. So at the risk of asking you to, doing, to do a little sort of prophecy, A, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen with that? Do you think that we're going to end up with kind of large established institutions that have, where, where you know, classics, musicology, and sort of the doing of the empirical sciences look very different, and you just get kind of a bifurcation there are kind of the smaller religious schools that are still really seriously reading, um, you know, Homer and Thomas Aquinas and whoever else. And then things just look very different at kind of the major universities. Or do you think that this is all kind of a tempest that will kind of settle down, that the people who are kind of protesting the classes and who are trying to, you know, water down the departmental requirements um, are going to just kind of shift gears and either grow up or change their minds. Mm -hmm. And what can be done in the interim? I mean, it was striking to me, um, uh, Professor Woodward, it was striking to me that the way Chicago <laughs> solved that particular example was not only by having a campus culture, but also presumably having people who were willing to enforce rules about a campus culture where students knew this is how we expect you to act, and if you don't act this way, we will not back down. It is you who will be backing down. So kind of what's going to happen and what can be done on the generational question? Or do you not perceive that as a divide and I'm, and I'm being worried about what happens when people my age come to power? <laughs> I, I don't worry too much about that. Um, I, I think every these kinds of debates have existed with each generation. Each generation of you know young eyes that come to things question them. I I, I think I, I see the current moment as, as just another one. Um, so I don't I don't think it's all you know going to fall apart. Um, you're right. Um, I, I think a strong culture is enforced by a strong set of guidelines and rules, but we don't. Um, but we have a strong culture at the University of Chicago, and we don't, it doesn't get to the, the point of, of, um, of having to discipline very often, in fact. I think there's a, a strong shared understanding. Um, we also have a bunch of support teams that help, because young people can sometimes make mistakes. And so there are um, you know, just members of the community, deans on call, who are you know, people who work at the university and all kinds of uh, uh, capacity. So we'll be on hand just to talk to people, not to not to be in forces, but to help everybody understand this, the situation that we're in. And it works quite well. Um, and, and you see you see accounts of things blowing up at other campuses. And I think if they had a better support structure in place, they might not have gotten to that to that point. So I guess I'm not as pessimistic as, as you are about the state of things. Um, the nature of what there is to know in the world changes a lot. It, it's expanding. That's challenging. It's challenging for institutions to, uh, of higher education to figure out what's the right way to educate and equip people for that. There isn't one right answer to that, but there are many possible right answers, I think. The, uh, I mean, I, I, I remain hopeful. I don't think there's an alternative to hope. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, the you know Nietzsche's last man or the soft despotism of the tyranny of the majority or whatever the dystopian alternative to you know to having thriving communities of learning with real heterodoxy you know with, with within them uh, seems too bleak. We we have to hope so. And it's a little for me it's a little bit of a variation. So what you're what you're predicting? Some people say it already happened from the '60s to the present, right? And uh, 
tenured radicals or, or whatever. So, so over and over again, you could see waves that look like they're gonna impose a new orthodoxy of some sort from the right or the left or religious or secular, a new orthodoxy on education, but it doesn't hold because, it's, uh, because our society is more pluralistic than that. So maybe the way I'd put it, what your, what your question prompts for me is, uh, what I often think of as my goal in this polarizing environment is to keep my campus community as heterogeneous and reflective of the whole array of American society. I say the whole array, maybe I wanna put a word like mainstream or something, because I don't think, <clears throat> We're not free speech absolutist, and we don't need to have every view at the table, of course, right? But our society, the polarities in it, we don't want our campuses. I don't want my campus. I think liberal education can't flourish if we sort for one part of that. Um, but, but that sorting is what's happening to some degree right now. And so I think that's part of the question is, is the polarity going to kind of rip, a, rip apart campuses? so that people go to get their education in the same echo chamber that, they're, that they want to engage in the rest of their political and social consciousness with, or do campuses, um, I'm tempted to say maintain, but some people might not believe that they've been this, but do they continue to maintain uh, the breadth of the society that their graduates need to re-enter and serve? And I have no reason to believe that's gonna be any more or less tested by the current wave of ascendant academics. It seems to me part of what happens is if you try to pretend the world is narrower than it actually is, you, you lose your customers eventually. The people who wanna understand the world as it is can, can see that. Now I'm not criticizing say a religious institution, I have tremendous respect for them, but one way or the other, if the, if the orthodoxy of thought is being imposed such that you know that 20%, 40%, 60% of Americans can't say what they really think about something fundamental to be in that classroom or to be on that campus, then that's gonna break open because somebody else is going to create a home for, for all those people. And I think most of us, most of us, I think, whatever we say, we know we want to be able to continue to communicate and learn from folks that are not that are not sorted uh, in, in advance that way. That's the premise for my, for my hope and optimism. Well, thank you very much. Um, in just a moment, we'll have to adjourn for lunch, which is um, right outside of this door. It's a buffet, and you can bring your, your, tables, your food back in here to these tables and continue the conversation. Um, before that, I want to remind you that we should all be back here at 1245 to hear from Nat Malkus. And I also want to ask you to please join me in thanking Walter and Amanda.
<laughs> okay. Um, thank you all, and we'll uh, get started on our uh, the afternoon portion of the program. So we're going to start with a uh, an address by um, Nat Malkus on education as cultural transmission. Oh, I want to. This is a, this marks the most significant transition in the conference, and this is not simply a a transition of the level of school that we're talking about, the, but the way in which we're talking about education, which I think I can best introduce uh, in uh, biographically. So this morning's uh, panel with a dean from the University of Chicago and a dean from St. John's College was like my comfort zone. The, um, the, the University of Chicago is my, uh, is my graduate uh, institution. The uh, St. John's College was like the pole star the, um, to me of, of what liberal education ought to be for many years teaching at a liberal arts college. I'm very comfortable with um, all this, uh, uh, the, the kinds of questions that we were talking about this morning, and I'm very comfortable with these institutions. But an interesting thing happened to me a couple of years ago when, uh, or about a year ago, when I moved from Furman University to doing my full-time work here, which is that my wife and I pulled back from simply instantiating the kind of education that we cared about as best we could every day in the classroom to thinking about what education is, and in particular, how we had come to the view of education that uh, we shared and tried to implement. And as a part of this effort to figure out the, um, what it was that, that we were doing and why we cared about it, we went back to a, a scene in the history of the University of Chicago, but also a scene in the history of American education known as the Great Chicago Fight. And the great Chicago fight was the result of the efforts of the famous University of Chicago president, Robert Maynard Hutchins, to execute an enormous reform the, um, in this institution, which met with bitter resistance the, uh, from all kinds, of, um, all kinds of quarters. Some of it justified the, um, and, uh, and some of it, um, well, and Hutchins was right on some things. The, um, so, uh, as it seems to me. So we went back to this. We're looking at the sources of this. And Hutchins actually identified his primary intellectual enemy as another great University of Chicago mind, John Dewey, uh, probably the most important educational philosopher of the, um, uh, in the United States uh, for at least the first half of the 20th century. And um, we went back to study these materials and I expected myself to be a 100% wholehearted Hutchins guy in looking at this debate. But we started reading these people, and I started thinking, you know, this, this, this Dewey fellow, he, he, he actually knows some stuff. And there's something about his perspective that is, that is broader, more capacious, more... Uh, He's, I, I don't know that I agree with his, his conclusions, but he's at least asking the question of the anthropology that underlies education in a really fundamental way. That is, he's asking, what is a human being, and what does it mean to educate a being like that? And my encounter with Hutchins in doing this way was a, was a lesson in my own narrowness. The, uh, that is, the, the, you know, there were, there were things that, as Jenna was describing this morning, that I loved about education that I was trying to do, but it was one very small slice of uh, what the whole project of education is. And so we wanted to set up this conference with intentionally uh, disparate speakers so as to get some sense of the range of what we mean when we talk about education in this country. And this brings me to, to, to our next speaker, Nat, Nat Malkus. So Nat is a senior fellow here at AEI, one of my colleagues, and he's our, our, the deputy director of our, um, of our education uh, policy team. And Nat is a, an expert on the big picture of what goes on in America's public schools. 
I want to give you uh, just one example of this. Nat has developed this astonishingly interesting data set called the Return to Learn Tracker. Uh, and so he and his colleagues started monitoring data from America's school districts, 8,400 school districts, that is all the school districts that have more than three schools in them, during the pandemic to discover, like, what are they doing? Are they, are they teaching in person? Uh, are they remote? Are they hybrid? Are they, do they, what are their masking policies? And eventually started looking at questions of, of, of their enrollments and how those enrollments were changing and how those changes correlated with the various kinds of um, policy decisions that these, that these institutions have made. So if you think about that, 8,400 schools, that is an astonishingly large set of, um, of inputs that Nat is taking into his thinking. So this seems to me, you know, if you think of, if our question is this philosophic question, what is education? And if Plato was right, and the way you figure something out is by a definitional process he calls collection and division, right? You try to find all the phenomena that fit into a certain category. If the category is education, well, one extreme would be St. John's College. And the other extreme would be the entirety of the American public school system. <laughs> <laughs> and so we are, uh, we are really pleased to have Nat um, come talk to us today from, uh, from the perspective of someone who studies that entire uh, uh, massive undertaking. And Nat's going to uh, talk to us about um, education as uh, cultural transmission. Nat Malkus. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks to uh, the Stories Ben and Jenna for this opportunity. Um, and I may be more comfortable talking about the Return to Learn Tracker. So if anyone wants to ask questions about that, I know a chapter and verse. But <laughs> today, I'm actually going to take a, uh, a swing at answering this big question, uh, what is education for? And I want to start uh, with a, a piece that came out in the New York Times last summer in a series that uh, the New York Times uh, published called What is School For? Uh, one piece in this series was by Nicolette Souter, and it pronounced that school is for connecting to nature. Uh, Souter is the creation of wild schooling, which is a form of homeschooling that celebrates an interconnected relational view of nature. And Souter's uh, children begin the day uh, orienting themselves to where they are in the moon cycle and the solar calendar. Uh, they run around, they do farm chores, they play the violin. Um, and they explore their natural surroundings. And schooling for Souter's children aims to be responsive to this natural environment. And as she describes it, if the frogs are singing, well, we'll learn about frogs. Now, this is an idyllic, um, if impractical, picture. But I want to focus on the claim in the title of the piece, that schooling is for connecting to nature. I think this claim probably strikes most of you as ridiculous. Uh, perhaps it's good for schools to connect kids to nature, but surely this is not what schooling is, is for. Uh, now, there are many more sensible answers to the question, what is school for? Uh, one piece in the Times was titled, School is for Economic Mobility. Another, School is for Making Citizens. Uh, and still another, School is for Learning to Read. And we could give other answers to this question. Uh, we might claim school is for building character, or for developing curiosity, or for preparing students for jobs. And I'm sure that you could come up with uh, many more answers to this question about one to, uh, what is school for. But what I want to suggest is that these specified answers are wrong, or they're at least woefully incomplete, and that they're wrong in the same way, the same way that the claim that schools is for connecting to nature is wrong. Saying that schools is for making citizens, I want to claim, though far more defensible, is just as mistaken as claiming that school is for connecting to nature. At least it's mistaken in the same way. Uh, so as a society, we have projects, and I'm, I'm using, this is not a coined term, I'm just using it to refer to particular forms of life that we care about and we want to pass on. And there are many of these. Uh, democracy, capitalism, liberalism, conservatism, individualism, the scientific enterprise, the Western literary tradition, jazz, hip-hop, film, Catholicism, Shia Islam, Reform Judaism, secular humanism, literacy, philosophy, math, history, anthropology, and even environmental conservation. Now, not all of these projects are sacrosanct, but some are. We don't hold one, we hold and we participate in many. 
and we hold some closer than others. They're not really ours. Um, we are the recipients of these projects. They precede us, and they will continue after we are gone. They're gifts from past generations, and during our lives, we try not only to be good custodians of these projects, assuming we find them worthwhile, we also try to embody them and to carry these projects forward and to advance them. We pass them on, and we live them out. Education, which I am not using here uh, in terms of formal education, but it's a much broader sense, is not for any one of these projects. Neither are schools, which make up a part of education, for only one of these projects. Education is for something larger. Uh, it's for all these projects and much more. What is education for? Uh, my answer is education is for cultural transmission. Now, this answer can leave you wanting. Uh, it may seem obvious, and perhaps it is, but I think that even if it is obvious, it's often overlooked, and it should not be. This statement that education is for cultural transmission, it's simple and perhaps unsatisfying, but it's fundamental to con uh, the consideration of questions about education and schooling that flow downstream from it. Now, I very, very much want to stay away from getting bogged down in trying to define culture, but I will hem it in just a bit. Um, Culture is our shared ways of being, and this is capacious. Um, it encompasses norms and mores, uh, morals, laws, and customs, language and knowledge, roles, rules, and hierarchies, institutions, and values, just to name a few things. Um, included in this capacious space, we will find all the projects that we as a society share to some degree and carry forward. But culture is also a means to an end. At its most basic level, it's the security and continuity of life. And once that is secured, it further provides the basis for which individuals can flourish. And it allows us to answer questions, or through it we answer questions, what might we do next and how might we do it? So why must this be transmitted? It must be transmitted because it's not innate. And because until it is translated, uh, transmitted, individuals cannot flourish or even function in society. And even beyond individuals, it must be transmitted because existing before us and carrying forward after us, must, we must through which we deliberatively and collectively transmit culture or formally educate students are an important part of education in our society. Indeed, uh, working in and studying schools has been my life's work. But it would be a mistake to confuse schooling with education in this broadest sense, since education uh, can and is largely done outside of schools. Um, we can look at this historically. Certainly for centuries, most people learned the ways of life to participate and flourish in their culture without schools. You can imagine generations in medieval Europe or China or Native American cultures across this country before the 18th and 19th century, quite uh, reasonably for most people. Uh, from pretty recently, to see that schools are not essential to this broader form of education that permits participation in cultures to which one belongs. Um, uh, school has not been as predominant as we now imag imagine it even in recent times. Based on OEC da data, prior to the Civil War, less than 20% of the world population over 15 was literate. That proportion broke 50% around 1940. Uh, those with a basic minimal education made up 33% of the world's population in 1990 and astonishingly hit 66% in my lifetime. Even today, at high school graduation, the average student in America will spend about 18% of their waking hours in school. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is a great deal of education happens outside of schools. Despite this, schools are fundamental to education in our culture. And in my mind, they're wonderful, or could be, and should be wonderful. Schools are institutions that we set up to systematically transmit our collective culture from one generation to the next. However, these are not the only places where culture is transmitted. Uh, culture is transmitted in the family, in the church, uh, even in the grocery store. And it is important that we submit and recognize this fact and give due respect to these other venues that transmit culture. Uh, I would advise more respect to families than the grocery store, but nonetheless. Uh, schools are principal means of cultural transmission, and that certainly includes transmitting these projects we care. Now, I don't mean that every school 
has the task to transmit all projects equally, but that schools should transmit culture and that systems of schools should serve to advance all the projects we cherish. Not in a process of simply uh, remaking or replicating, but by transferal and transmitting to the next generation. Uh, let me admit, this is a bulky and unwieldy construction. I'm not entirely comfortable with it, this idea that schools should transmit culture. But I believe it's a vital uh, starting point to protect against the mistakes that I alluded to earlier. The, these common mistakes to many of the request, uh, uh, responses to the questions, what is education for or what is school for, both in the Time series and in many other instances, is that they hold too narrow a conception of what education and schools are for, and that those narrow conceptions result in too narrow of a prescription for how we might address them. Uh, they mistake specific projects as what schools are for or should be for, what education is or should be for. And in articulating these purposes as tailored to a particular project or the failure to pursue a particular project, they risk falling to the temptation of believing that their pet project is actually what schools should be for. Such mistakes have results. Most often they promote changes or charges to achieve that particular project at the expense of other projects. Often at the expense of projects that other parts of the culture and even they themselves may hold dear. I wanna to turn to a couple of examples, not in the Times series. Uh, in 1976, the economists Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gittes published Schooling in Capitalist America. And they argued that schools are organized according to what they termed the correspondence principle Schools, they write, structure social interactions and individual rewards to replicate the environment of the workplace. Bowles and Gintis, Marxists both, make this out to be some deep, dark problem with schooling. However, the correspondence principle, if it is correct, is hardly dark at all. Schooling in America is shaped by millions of teachers educating tens of millions of students. To expect schooling in capitalist America to not reflect capitalist America is to expect large swaths of the American public to break with American culture and for millions of parents to assent to this. Schools reproduce broader culture? Of course they do. Now, Bowles and Gintis do not recommend a curricular intervention or an education reform model to remedy the problems with schooling in capitalist America. They have a bigger aim, a bigger project, and they put it bluntly. The overriding strategic goal of a socialist movement is the creation of working class consciousness. Fair enough. And give them their due, Bowles and Gintis understand that schooling in capital America is cultural transmission. Nonetheless, they are willing and do push their project enough to give some advice for those involved in education. They write, even within the classroom, the dissident teacher can become an effective subversive through teaching the truth about society, through inspiring a sense of collective power and mutual respect, through demonstrating that alternatives superior to capitalism exist, through fighting racist, sexist, and other ideologies of privilege, through the criticizing and providing alternatives to a capitalist culture. Surely, Bowles and Gintis believe schools transmit culture, but they do want schools to remake culture and to do so according to their project. Uh, does this sound at all familiar to you? We hear echoes of it from within the teaching profession, and they alarm us, some of us. Here is one just this month from the Colorado Education Association who accepted the proposition. CEA believes that capitalism requires exploitation of children, public schools, land, labor, or resources. Capitalism is in opposition to fully addressing systemic racism, the school-to-prison pipeline, climate change, patriarchy, gender and LGBTQ disparities, educational inequality, and income inequality. Uh, I, I submit that to the ears of many parents and to many people, these sentiments from a group representing educators are a bit alarming and they raise valid questions about the degree to which such attitudes shape the delivery of education in schools through what Bowles and Gentis would no doubt call criticizing and providing alternatives to the capitalist culture. While the, the classic Marxism of Bowles and Gentis uh, may have receded, or perhaps not, um, we see similar patterns in critical approaches to understanding schools and to school reform. Uh, a, a recent presidential address in History Education Quarterly by Rutgers' Ben Justice was aptly titled, Schooling as a White Good. 
Um, Dr. Justice writes, schooling in the United States has never been a public good, nor has the public good been its primary goal. Since its origins in the early 19th century, schooling has been a white good designed to promote white advantage. Insofar as schooling has approached being a public good, that tendency has emerged as a result of counter-majoritarian, explicitly racial, racial activism led by non-white people. The struggle for racial justice has been the struggle of moving schooling from a white good to a public good. Now, whether you agree with the specifics of Justice's argument or not, the problem he identifies is real. Schools reflect the broader culture, and sometimes the broader culture contains within it sinister elements. These deserve addressing. In fact, I, I think our culture demands they be addressed. However, Justice's argument fails to do justice to schooling in the United States. By his conception that equity has never been a significant project in schools, it just fails the sniff test. What's more problematic is that these overwrought logics can push adherents to pursue equity with a disregard for other projects we hold dear. Occasionally, the myopia of the equity project can make this dissonance plain. In 2014, San Francisco United School District, Unified School District rather, instituted a detracking initiative. They eliminated accelerated math and high school math classes, including the option for advanced students to take Algebra I in eighth grade. Let me make this clear. The policy was that accelerated classes would only be allowed in 11th and 12th grade. Controversial from the start, SFUSD marshaled select evidence and lauded uh, their success in the press based on course enrollments and passing grades. It was lauded as a model for other districts in the press. Independent analyses, however, have shown a dark lining on this silver crowd, the cl cloud. By 2019, five years later, High school math test scores showed growth among white and Asian students, but no improvements for black and brown students in San Francisco. Test-based achievement gaps widened, and they widened more in San Francisco than in the rest of the state. They did this while prohibiting all the district students in grades 8 to 10 from opportunities to take advanced math. There are 50,000 students in San Francisco, USD. This is a concrete example, and it's important not simply because equity-focused crusaders can give short shrift to countervailing projects, among them the pursuit of excellence and individual liberties, at least for students who want eighth grade algebra. It's important because in their, their confidence in their crusade, these San Francisco crusaders have missed that their efforts abetted increasing inequality. In 2019, San Francisco black and brown 11th grade math scores were closer to the state average math scores of fourth graders than they were to fifth graders. Though not definitive, it appears that this pursuit hampered transmission of basic competencies for cultural participation. Now, lest I give you the impression that all these projects are political, let me list one that escapes that view and, uh, not coincidentally, will bolster some of my anti-tracking bona fides. Uh, in, in some of my work on career and technical education, which we call CTE in the, in the biz, uh, I have heard claims of proponents clamoring for more and more career-relevant education. And this can be good, but it can also be a regression. In a pre-pandemic visit to a high school, a vice principal explained uh, at, at the school explained the recent reconstitution of the district's high schools into career academies. Uh, each school gave its students the choice of three different career academies. Uh, in this one, there was a business management academy, a, a modern service academy, and the STEM academy. When I asked the vice principal, how do, how do students in ninth grade choose these academies? He made it fairly plain. Students who tested into the STEM academy uh, usually entered. Students with poor academic preparation often ended up in the Modern Service Academy, and the bulk of the rest wound up in the Business Management Academy. This CTE achievement on paper looked a lot like the tracking San Francisco wants to deconstruct. By embracing the CTE project, these schools had pretty transparently abandoned other. Now, implicit in this question, what is education for, is the should of this all. What should education be for, and, and more specifically, what should schools be for? And I don't have a simple answer for that. In fact, I don't even think we should attempt 
to answer what every school should be for. But I do want to sketch out some parameters to answer what school systems should sh look like in our culture so that they will transmit culture well. Schools should prepare students to participate in our culture and to flourish in our culture and to advance our culture in ways that are consistent with our culture. How so? Well, like my capacious definition of cultural transmission, I'm going to offer a very broad and perhaps unsatisfying target, but it's one I think we share and it's compatible with most of our other projects. It's very closely held, and I think the Declaration, a document that our culture holds dear for good reason, provides a clear foundation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, I think education is part of fulfilling that, and the central project that I will point to is individualism. And, it, and it's freedom to in, uh, giving individuals freedom to engage fully with our capacious culture. Uh, we care about the autonomy of the individual, and our views of education and of schools should care about treating those people, we call them students, as ends, not as means. This requires recognizing that students have their own reasons for their actions and that we should respect those reasons. Treating people as ends and not as means entails giving them the capacity to pursue the good life in our culture as they conceive of it. It means giving them access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This project of the individual may be first among all our projects. It's arguably the basis for freedom of religion, speech, of tolerance, and democracy itself. We respect the autonomy of the individual, and so we let him practice his religion. So we let her say what she likes. So we are tolerant when others choose to live a life in accordance to values that we think are wrong or even offensive. And so we let her have say in the laws she is obligated to follow. The project of the individual is one of our central projects in education. Indeed, the value we place on the project of the individual accounts for our widely shared desire that each student gets an education. Uh, and, and by this, of course, I include a formal education. Without a good education, students will be limited. They will have diminished ability to control their own lives. They will be less free, not only insofar as they will have fewer career options or less money, but they will also be less free and limited in terms of what they can think or do. Since we value the individual, a good education should promote the autonomy of students by making them literate and intellectually capable at a basic level. But this goal of minimal competencies, while obvious, um, we should note that we do not now achieve this. Remember, the average uh, math scores of 11th grade black and brown students in San Francisco are below the fifth grade state average. And San Francisco is not alone here. We have school systems where these kinds of failures have persisted for academic generation after academic generation. This dismal truth is likely the first line of attack that I think we should choose. And if the painful dismantling of these systems is required for their redress, I will throw the first stone. Of course, minimal competencies is just the foundation. We want to do more. We want to transmit opportunities so students can pursue whatever career or life might interest them to give them the resources with which to navigate a life. I think this is a big part of the idea behind the liberal or liberating arts. They are freeing insofar as they enhance our ability to tackle life, to better choose what sort of life we want to live and to better judge what sort of life is best. But even this is not enough. Our cultural riches, our economic strength, and our scientific progress will not be transmitted through minimal competencies or even merely through the liberal arts. We need a functioning system of schools that on the whole is capable of transmitting those riches um, that can maintain meaningful paths to pursue the variety of opportunities that our culture does and could provide. Such a school system will need to be capacious and varied enough for more than minimal cultural transmission but to include paths of inquiry where students are given access for their work, sweat, and merit will lead to the expertise and specialization that could let them enjoy, reshape, and extend our culture. 
In my mind, this system should include robust and varied sets of K-12 and post-secondary institutions. The provision that I'm talking about here can't be done in every school, not in each school. The choices our culture wants to afford students demand a varied set of institutions. Indeed, institutions that embody and thereby allow students to embody a palpable and coherent culture within our culture. My fear is that when many schools and even school systems attempt to be all things for all students, they limit their capacity to transmit culture well. A system of education that allows individuals to flourish in our culture must provide choices for students and families. And for those choices to be meaningful, especially as students progress past basic competencies into secondary and post-secondary school, we should allow schools to embody not just an approximation of culture that often falls too distant to be fulfilling, but a coherent vision of culture embodied in each institution. This entails allowing schools as particular institutions to embody particular missions, not as a centralized crusader might, but as an intact community that embodies, that lives out, and that transmits its own coherent subculture. Briefly, a final note on crusaders. Education and schooling must be capacious because our culture is capacious. And there are many projects in our culture that we want to transmit to allow individuals to participate fully in that culture. Still, we have many crusaders in education. By crusaders, I don't mean culture warriors. I mean those who want to make education about one thing, those who want to reduce education to a single project or just a few, but to their projects and to do it at scale. We should be constantly wary of the crusaders, political or not, who attempt to make education smaller, to pare down the richness and diversity of the culture that we transmit through our systems of education. Some of these crusaders want to make education about character, but in so doing, they'll miss out on job skills. Others may privilege job skills, and in so doing, miss out on citizenship. Others are willing to privilege citizenship at the expense of science or morality. Education and the schools that serve it should strive to develop students who can engage with our culture in the broadest sense. And it should do so by recognizing just how broad the culture we seek to transmit is and to transmit a coherent view of it. Even more than that, crusaders run the risk of pushing the system into proselytizing to recruit students to their cause to indoctrinate students. Sometimes these crusaders are in service of projects that you and I hold dear. When you establish school systems that tell students that the purpose of education is social progress or character or democracy or job skills, you run the risk of converting them to your cause and you risk establishing a system that tells them what to believe instead of exposing them to what they might embody. Schooling should not be for crusaders. It should be for the thoughtful custodians and transmitters of our culture. Thank you, Nat. We've got a, um, time for a few questions here. Let me, um, let me just ask the first one. So you described education as a project of cultural transmission and this project of cultural transmission you were careful to specify is something that goes on both inside and outside of schools. That is, the schools are not the only site of cultural transmission, something that seems, seems clear. How would you describe the kind of cultural transmission that is specific to schools, that is specific to education in that institutional form? Like what sort of, what, what, what sort of culture is it the business of schools to transmit? So we're in the dividing portion, I, th I no, think, We're right? in the part yes, dividing, okay. yes, yes, that's um, right, that's right. So I, I actually, um, I'm gonna have a, I have a little cheat code here, and that's because I can say, well, our culture has established these things. I think largely um, the, the things that we see in schools uh, have a lot uh, to say for them. Right? Mm -hmm. We have uh, courses of study that uh, try and give a basic appreciation of our, um, our, our, our common culture. That includes our heritage. It includes our, uh, the, you know, our sciences, reading, the ability to participate mm -hmm. in um, 
culture as it is manifested, certainly participation in um, civic life and in uh, democracy. These are like super broad terms, but I wouldn't say, you know, it's time to revitalize all these schools. We need a huge transformation. I do think that in the tug and pull that uh, we have in our systems of education, that um, we get a lot of the um, shapes right, mm -hmm. even if we don't always fill them. Now, exactly what those are, uh, again, I don't have uh, any sort of prescription that would say, well, we need to move drastically from mm -hmm. one point to another. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, much of my concern is in doing these uh, transmissions a little better, more effectively. Mm -hmm. I think efficiency mm -hmm. has a lot to, to say for these things. Um, and I also think that these things should have more choice and more diffusion as we sort of climb the ladder. Let me, let me just ask one quick follow-up, which is you, you referred there to effective transmission. And I want to ask, so to, to think about this in terms of a, a case in point, what does it look like to effectively transmit science, for example? Yeah, so uh, again, not to put too uh, fine a point on it, it's to give someone the foundation, and as they grow into it, the full ability to participate in uh, the sciences as mm -hmm. we practice them. Um, so let's just be specific. I do a lot of economics mm -hmm. type work in education. Um, there's a road to understanding the basic scientific method, the way we gather data, the way markets work, um, the way data can tell us things about events if we analyze it correctly. This is part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. building a ladder from the, the basics in uh, the, the early days of school that provides a foundation for students to participate in that culture is the way that we uh, transmit that culture to, to students. If, if this fails to be specific enough to get your hands around you, it, it is. I don't have narrow prescriptions for how these things work, but I do think that um, we need to include them all in our pur purview when we think about a system of schooling. Mm. So it's, it's, it's in a way that the, the transmission of the activity of science at least as much as it is the transmission of a body of knowledge. Does that seem right? I, I, I don't think that you could sort of have the one without the other. Sure. And I would certainly um, say that when we try and transmit culture um, to, uh, to students, we, we want to um, give them not only the knowledge and the abilities, mm -hmm. but um, the, the many other portions. You know, we'll talk about these in uh, K-12 education like soft skills. Mm -hmm. um, Th those should not be dismissed in a particular project of, well, we want, uh, we want excellent regressions from our economists. <laughs> uh, that sort of is an outgrowth and, a, and a, um, sort of a fractal that we climb out of our culture, but it's, it's certainly linked. Very good. Yeah. All right, we've got uh, time for a few questions from our, from our audience. Uh, I think that's Joe Wasaki back there. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Joe, I work here, so I know you're supposed to speak. Oh, that sorry, that was, that was my job. He's worked here longer than me. <laughs> Just speak loud. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, no, thank you very much for your talk. I particularly like the, um, the point about sort of fracturing out these various projects and how they can swallow up the others, um, which ultimately, in my mind, the problem there is that it leads to a less uh, complete human being but I, I want to be a little provocative on the on the sort of overall thesis of education as cultural transmission, sure. um, and cultural transmission seems important in my mind. Maybe maybe as a means to getting to sometimes um, what you kind of dismissed at the beginning, the sort of understanding of nature, which in that in the sort of hippy dippy uh, understanding of nature is pretty narrow. But I guess the question I'm getting at. Um, is there a sort of rejection of, well, is, is education as cultural transmission, tell me how that's not um, sort of perpetuating life in the cave, hmm. in, in Plato's cave. So I, I think we're contextual human beings who live in a particular place, but ultimately that culture would be a way, a means by which we approach nature, the nature and, and true understandings about things that ultimately is beyond nature in the cave. So how, how would, do you see what I'm saying? So how is 
perpetuating culture different from continuing to live in the cave? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think so. I, I think that, um, that capacious is the watchword and it enables me to do many things here. But <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll say that you know, that is part of the, the culture that we hand down. And it may be that, and I should, um, I, I should apologize to the author of the, uh, the, the nature. I, I don't <laughs> indeed think that she was saying that all schools should, should do this. But look, we do have a cultural approach to connecting kids to nature. And you can say we really do an insufficient job at that. I think the key thing um, that I want to provoke in folks to consider is um, at what cost? So we, we can't improve on sort of these particular uh, items or projects and just say, oh, we're just going to get more efficient. We can do all this better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Usually there is a cost to these things. And we need to be aware of those costs because mm -hmm. when we're dealing with um, particularly little students, they are not yours to disregard. Um, as far as whether our culture has roots available for people, some people, perhaps not all people, but we aspire to that, to uh, enable them to uh, connect with nature in a community that values that, I, I think we want to make that available and have a system of schools that's supple enough to promote that. It, it, it's not a magic catch-all. In the middle of Kansas, you're not going to get 13 schools that do exactly what you want, but I do think that we want to think about schooling in our school systems in such a way that they enable us to build out not a single culture, but uh, a sort of a coherent culture that students can, can work within and work their way out of the cave. Right, that's right. I just meant like human, human nature, exactly what I'm saying. Not like understanding creatures, basically understanding like the nature of things, not what's in them. That's yes. Kind of Right. Well, uh, uh, again, I would say that we, um, I, I think that we have room in our culture for exploring uh, human nature. I think we, we do it. We do it in schools. I do it in church every Sunday. Um, and I, 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 I think that we should include the capacities, certainly, and the uh, areas of study that it should be available to students to focus in on that. But whether we privilege that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, another aspect of what we may do, I, I think we have to consider that in its totality. Okay, everybody, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to be the heavy now. The, I'm going to enforce the rules of civil discourse, which means ending the question session. The, which, not because you are uncivil, the, but because we're on a tight timeline. The, uh, so um, uh, we've got about 10 minutes until we start our, um, our afternoon session at about, um, at about 1.40. The, um, so we'll take a, um, a short break now, the, but please join me in, um, in thanking Nat Malkus, and I hope you'll take the, uh, the chance to talk with him so I'm outside the time. Thank you, Nat.
you know, you sit on this stage a few times and you really start thinking about your socks. <laughs> okay, everybody, if you could, if we could head back to our seats. Okay, you all, we're going to go ahead and get started with our, with our final session today. <clears throat> okay, uh, it's time for our uh, final uh, session on this, on this second installment in our conference series on the future of the American University, where we're dealing with the, the broadest philosophic question that, that underlies the, the work of, of, of universities, which is the question of what is education. And I'm particularly excited about this last panel because one of the things that my wife and I discovered in, in moving out of the university is that a lot of the people who are most articulate about the basic work educational institutions do are actually people working in the K-12 sector. And I particularly have in mind uh, K-12 headmasters, particularly headmasters or CEOs or principals of startup schools. Because if you are launching a brand new school that is perhaps a one-of-a-kind school, you have to give an account of the entirety of the educational enterprise. You have to explain why you do everything you do, what you assume about the students when they walk in the door, and where you want them to be when they walk out. And so I'm very pleased to have uh, a couple of people who have engaged um, uh, in this work to talk with us this afternoon about the nature of education. So I'll begin with um, Ian Rowe. Ian Rowe is a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute. He earned his degrees from uh, Cornell University and Harvard University. The, um, but, you know, I, I promise he's, he's really a smart guy. Um, and uh, he, has had a, uh, he has had an impressive career in business, government, and philanthropy that has taken him from MTV to the Gates Foundation to the White House. Uh, since, uh, since then, Ian has led two networks of charter schools. First, uh, for 10 years, he was the CEO of a network called Public Prep, which was a set of public charter schools in the Bronx. And he is now the CEO of Vertex Partnership Academies, which is a, a network of character-based international baccalaureate schools, which opened just this fall, uh, also in the South Bronx. And uh, in addition to his, his work as an educational leader, uh, Ian is also the author of a book called Agency, the Four-Point Plan for All Children to Overcome the Victimhood Narr Narr Narrative, excuse me, and discover their pathway to power, which I would describe as a remarkably uh, sensible, practical, and personal work of educational philosophy. So I recommend that book to you all. Um, joining uh, Ian in conversation today is uh, Peter Crawford. Peter is the headmaster of the St. Jerome Institute uh, Catholic High School here in uh, the District of Columbia. Peter earned his degrees from Ave Maria University and the University of Leuven in, in Belgium, and began his career as a teacher of history and humane letters at the Glendale Preparatory Academy uh, out in Arizona. He then went on to found a couple of schools uh, as part of the Great Hearts Network of classical charter schools uh, that, that time in Texas. And after that, he has uh, come to DC to found the St. Jerome Institute. And the St. Jerome Institute is a, is a part of a, of a larger project, sometimes called the St. Jerome Project, of renewal in Catholic uh, education. And Peter has helped uh, oversee the, the high school level of that project, which has become a model for Catholic schools looking to renew themselves around the country. In a few months, uh, Peter will be taking up a new position as the Dean of Academics for the Institute of Classical Liberal Education, where he will be bringing his remarkably holistic uh, vision of educational renewal 
to schools across the country, um, and he'll be doing that full time. So I'm very uh, happy to be joined by Ian Rowe and Peter Crawford. Uh, so I am particularly excited to talk to the two of you about the question of education. As I, as I mentioned, as in, in your roles as the founders of schools, you have to answer the question of what you're doing on a uh, broader and deeper level than almost anybody else involved in this, um, in this business. So what do you say? The, uh, Ian, uh, I'll start with you. What is, what is education as your schools have sought to put it into practice? Uh, thank you, uh, Ben, for that uh, great uh, opening question. And thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, fantastic uh, discussion. Um, so we just launched a new uh, virtues-based international baccalaureate high school uh, in the Bronx. And we have deliberately organized uh, the school uh, around the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. And our hope and our design is that everything, everything uh, related to the school, our curricula, our rituals, our instruction, mm. uh, are reinforcing those uh, four uh, core virtues, because we believe that those four core virtues are rooted uh, um, and are, are the root of almost all other character-based strengths that we want kids uh, to aspire to, uh, because we fundamentally believe that those are foundational to the ingredients of human flourishing. And so that's what we've told our authorizer, that's what we've, and, the, and we lead with that, you know, before we get to math and science and all that, and, and we think uh, it's really important. I, I love what, um, you know, Nat, his whole presentation was that education is about cultural transmission, and and I wasn't this guy before, but I would actually say education, or, or another way to say that, is that education is about indoctrination. Mm. You know, indoctrination has taken on a, a, a negative word, um, but it's usually because we don't like whatever we're describing. We don't like the values that they're <laughs> indoctrinating. So we say indoctrination is bad. And, and for us, actually, we, we do want to indoctrinate. We, we, we're just being very deliberate about the, ah. the virtues that um, we're hoping to inculcate within our kids. It's this idea um, that we want to make the implicit explicit mm. and just be very deliberate about what we want to do. And I'll just say that you know, I, I, I certainly wasn't always this guy. Like you mentioned, I've, I've run schools for a number of years. And I, I, even if you asked me 10 years ago, I wouldn't have described the purpose of education as I just did. I mean, I'm, I'm a product of the New York City, you know, K to 12 public education system. I had a great education. I went to Brooklyn Tech. You know, I was, I was strong in math, and I got into a great engineering school. And you know, even in my professional life, when I was at, at the White House, I was there you know, when No Child Left Behind was passed, and we pa you know, passed very pragmatic legislation, like every kid in the country should be proficient in math and reading in third grade. You know, all, all these thing, things seemed. Um, pretty logical and pretty pragmatic. Um, and even when I was running uh, Public Prep, the first network, you know, just run a good school, great academics, that, that should be good enough. And uh, I had an epiphany moment, which I won't go through in detail, but you know, in 2016, when we were in the South Bronx and we had great demand for our schools, um, I, we, I had an epiphany moment which underscored the issue that, that families mm. played a much bigger role in defining the long-term outcomes of our kids. And um, it forced me to just think differently mm. about what our schools were actually seeking to do, that it was necessary to build great schools academically, but not sufficient. Mm. And, and we just had to take this broader view, particularly as it related to the role of the family, because you know, as Nat says, education, schools are cultural transmission. I would argue family is the first mm -hmm. institution for which our, our culture and almost everything else uh, is transmitted. And in this experience where I really started to realize that you know, the, the non-marital birth rates, you know, I'll go again, going into detail, like in the Bronx, is like 84%, you know, like 
more than you know, close to nine in ten babies that are born are born outside mm -hmm. of marriage, and you, and those numbers, if you go to Appalachia and Chicago and lots of other places, that's kind of the norm. And we wonder why the first civic institution isn't strong. Mm. Um, it makes it much harder for all of the other institutions that we rely upon um, to transmit our culture and the ingredients of human flourishing. So as I really started to think about our school, I started to think about, in, in, on all of my experience, what have been the factors that really drive young people to be successful mm. or not? You know, and I've worked with every kind of kid. I've worked with rich kids, poor kids, white kids, black kids, Asian kids, Hispanic kids, kids in homeless shelters, um, kids in foster care, adoption. Um, and I have witnessed young people in some very challenging situations growing up. As they enter young adulthood, they have made decisions that have recreated mm. the same cycle of disadvantage, mm. right? But I've also seen young people in domestic violence, poverty, really tough situations, as they make their decisions into young adulthood, make different sets of decisions. And the question, like the animating question in my life is why? You know, what makes a difference? What were the experiences that these young people had that were able to empower them to break the cycle of disadvantage? And my observation has been that they have typically had a sense of personal agency, this, this ability to lead a self-determined life. Mm. Where I define agency as the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. Mm. You know, the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. Mm. So, because everyone has free will, right? So the question is, how do you exercise that free? Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Mm -hmm. And that's where, uh, and this is something we very much we want to do in our schools, is that I've observed, and again, I, well, I'll pass the mic, um, <laughs> but I've observed that the pillars that really matter to young people are family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. Mm. Those are the four pillars that if, if we have the ability through schooling and all the other institutions to encourage more young people to embrace those four pillars, I think we'd, we'd see a, a, a revolution um, in agency and self-determination and stronger families, stronger civic communities. I'm happy to go into each one, but I now want to build schools that go far beyond just these academics mm. and really inculcate young people into the understanding of the power that these pillars can provide within their lives. Wow, okay. So education here with the emphasis squarely on a project of moral formation. That is the heart of the enterprise, as I think you're describing. It. Yeah, and you know, Nat said something interesting. You, you don't want to go one without the other. This, you know, so we still have to teach math and science, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, but it's got to be core. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 moral formation, um, the very purpose of what you're doing, has to be integral to um, everything that you're doing alongside having very high academic expectations and everything else that is required in school. So it, it is, I mean, I, I do think, like when I went, you know, my parents were married for 48 years. So many things about my life is a function of what they provided for me. So it's probably the case that I'm projecting more onto schools, mm. um, things that I got from my parents that I didn't get from my own K to 12 education but because of where we are with families in our country, there has to be a period yeah. of time where our schools, I think, have to take on a little bit more a deliberate approach. Mm. The, uh, so Peter Crawford, the, um, how, do you, uh, how do you answer this question of what it is that the schools that you lead should be doing? What is, what is education as it goes on in these places? Well, thank you, Ben. And Thank you for inviting me here. I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to partake in this conversation and uh, delighted to be in conversation with Ian. Um, and also extremely grateful that we're asking this question about what education itself is. Um, I've been kind of complaining to people who know me that uh, we presume all the time that we know what education is. We never mm. actually talk about the thing itself. And now I find myself in the very dangerous position of having to answer the question, <laughs> uh, which is 
I think, uh, I think is risky. Um, so I think I'll start out by saying that I think our tendency today as moderns is to um, think about education in a very specific way, um, to think of it in narrow terms. But within the tradition, classically, education has a very expansive, broad meaning. And uh, I was reminded of this in Walter's reference to uh, education in agricultural terms. And this is, in fact, a, a classical analogy. This is something that Cicero refers to, for instance, that, um, in fact, the word itself, etymologically, is uh, a farming term that we are um, raising kids in the same way that we might raise a plant, raise a tree, um, I think within the soil of a culture, within the soil of a, a common understanding of what it is to be human, something of the world, and, uh, and contained within it an interesting dialectic that um, on the one hand, uh, in this cultivation, students are receiving a cultural legacy and on the other hand, they are the promise of a renewal or continuation of, uh, of culture and of our shared understanding as humans. Um, there's a, I think, not well known, but a really significant essay written by a German philosopher, Robert Spiemann. And uh, his title is a definition for education. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, the title is, uh, education as an introduction to reality. And I think that's a great definition. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first, maybe when people hear that definition, they think it's not saying anything or it's too broad, <laughs> right? But if we step back and think about it for a moment, there's a, lot, there's a lot that's in that understanding of education. That when we are a student, when we are being educated, when we are um, being fostered, we are being introduced, inaugurated into reality. Um, so we could dip into that more perhaps, I think we will. Um, I also wanna say that um, as we're trying to not just stay in the abstract but think about that in a particular way, um, that there are some very specific characteristics of a good education. Mm. Um, that it has to have an with the tradition. I think the, the second is uh, that it has to be relevant to the student's lived experience. Um, it has to be something that the student's actually in conversation with in their lives. Uh, a third, I think, is that it has to be critical. So um, there's an Italian thinker, Luigi Giussani, who has this beautiful analogy for an important moment that happens in a young person's life. He says that um, a child has this backpack on that they've been carrying with them. And it's this, this cultural inheritance that they have. And they, they, they start bearing it as a really little kid. And then they carry it along with them into adolescence and their teenage years and for the rest of their lives. But there comes this important moment where they have to take the backpack off. Mm -hmm. And they have to open it up. And they have to consider it and think about it in a deep and rigorous way. And, um, and so, in other, in other words, in order for an education to be a good education, a student has to make it their own. Hmm. It has to be something that they've actually considered and aren't just, they aren't just bearing. Hmm. Um, I think, fourthly, an education has to be a moral education. And this means that it has to tell us something about action. It has hmm. to tell us something about how we should conduct ourselves in life. Um, but that also means, I think, that it's an education, a formation of the heart. Mm. And this means, what is it to love? And then I think also it's a formation of the sort of things that we should love. Mm. Um, and then finally, and I think maybe this will seem esoteric, unless there are uh, Brothers K fans <laughs> in the audience. Hopefully there are, yeah. Um, I think that... Uh, I think that an education has to give students sacred memories. Hmm. 
memories of the good that they carry with them throughout their lives, through the peaks and the valleys of, uh, of their time on this earth, that act as a, as a lighthouse to them, uh, that will call them, we'll call them home. And I think that's the sort of the minimum inheritance that an education has to give, a good education has to give a child, uh, a student, in order to be successful. Hmm. But this is, these are two beautiful and I think largely coherent uh, visions of, of education that the two of you have outlined. I want to, so I want to try to um, be annoying and, um, uh, and, and nudge you on a point where, where I think there might be at least some apparent disagreement Ian, in the subtitle of, 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 um, of agency, that you describe education as a way for children to discover their pathway to power. And I want to ask what you mean by power and what you th why you think it's a fitting aim for education. And then, and then Peter, to, to go ahead and get the provocation fully out on the table, Viv, you have criticized what you call the industrial model of education precisely because it opens the door to power. The, um, that is, that that's what educators are saying, is that what we're here to do for you is open your doors to, um, to power. So, um, so what, what, you, what alternative do you propose as the proper aim of education? So first, what is power and why do you think it's good? And uh, Peter, what do you think is a better idea? Wow. <laughs> uh, good, good question. Um, so we actually have a class uh, at Vertex Partnership Academies called uh, Pathways to Power. Um, and it's, the class is organized around uh, essentially goal setting over the course of the next eight to 10 years of your life, what you think the obstacles will be, and what your strategies will be for overcoming them, and, and hence the term pathways. We're actually considering shifting the title slightly, mm -hmm. and maybe this might provide some insight to your question, um, from pathways to power to pathways to the power within. Huh. Pathways to the power within. And the reason that is a subtle but potentially very important shift is that it reinforces that, we're, again, what we're trying to do is help you understand the tools of your own liberation, the, the pillars that if you embrace, that imbues to you your own power within. And, 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 and the reason I think this is important now is that we're living at a time, and I do write about this in my book, that you know, young people are getting lots of messages about how powerless they are. Mm. You know, um, based on your race, your class, your gender, you know, the country itself is rigged against you. Um, capitalism is evil. Mm -hmm. um, if you're black, you know, there's a white supremacist lurking on every corner. Um, and that these systems are rigged against you. You know, these systems are, are so powerful, so discriminatory, so rigged, that you are powerless to overcome them. Um, and so young people, I think, need a counterbalance to mm -hmm. that message, what I often call blame the system. But then simultaneously, there's what I also call blame the victim, which is, a, which is kind of the philosophy on the other side, which says that if you're not successful in this country, it's not because America itself is racist or, or discriminatory. In fact, America is the land of opportunity. America is great. If you're not successful in this sort of blame the victim ideology, it's because you're the problem, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You um, squandered all these great opportunities that have been um, put in front of you. And so, you know, of course, it's, it's hard. Like, if you're 12 years old and you're in, in, you know, District 7, where our school is in the Bronx, where, you know, the non-marital birth rate is 84 percent, um, only 7 percent of kids graduate from high school ready for college, and there's a cap on charter schools, so you, you can't even mm -hmm. launch great new schools. It's hard to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps in that. Um, in that context. So between these two narratives, blame the victim, blame the system, either the system's rigged against you or it's your fault for not <laughs> overcoming it, you know, you don't feel like you have much agency uh -huh. in your own life. And so, so when I say power, um, the pathway is to power within. It's, it's not power in the sense of we need to gain control over the, you know, you know, you know rule against the masses. Like this is, no, this is, this is your ability to lead a self-determined life. But you have to understand the pillars that, for eons, we've understood 
the pillars around family, religion, education, ultimately entre entrepreneurship, are those vehicles through which we, we transmit cultural values. We understand the virtues. We understand the most important civic institution is not the family that you're from, but the family that you're about to form. Mm. Those are the things that, in my observations, give young people power, mm. but it's really the power within. Mm. Yeah, so that sounds so pretty match good. That. Yeah, all right. yeah, all right. That sounds pretty <laughs> good. <Do> my best. <laughs> that sounds pretty good, Peter. What's, what's, what's the matter with power? I was no, still no, warm and fuzzy until the within. last moment. <laughs> power within. That's, good. That's great. No, I mean, uh, honestly, I think uh, that Ian and I have a lot in common. I think we have a different vocabulary. <laughs> All right, we have less in common now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is a uh, plague of passivity mm -hmm. in uh, today's youth. And, uh, and I think, you know, it occurs in, in different kids of different backgrounds for different reasons, but it seems to be pervasive mm -hmm. that young people are deeply passive and seem to be, I agree, disenfranchised, feel powerless, feel like nothing that they do makes a difference or has any meaning. Um, and I'm very concerned about that as well. Um, I'm concerned about the word power. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about words, maybe too much. And uh, my concern around this word power is that I don't think it, that it has within it any moral structure. Mm. So I don't want to give kids power any more than I want to give them cash. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the money for? What's the power for? What's the end of this? Mm -hmm. um, so I want, to, uh, I want kids to go off and do important and meaningful things, to take action in the world, to pursue their destiny. Um, but I don't know that the word power contains uh, what they need in order to take that path. So, I mean, I think the end to education, as I understand, is happiness. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if what we're thinking about is, well, what's a word that could perhaps, for me, replace the very real need that Ian is identifying? Um, I would choose a rather politically incorrect word of authority. Huh. Um, and authority is also, um, see, here's, here's a pattern is also an agricultural uh, term at its root. It means to, to make grow wealth. Huh. Mm. So uh, a true authority is a parent. A true authority ought to be a teacher. Um, but you know there was this big debate in, in the ancient times about how authority was bestowed, why it was that some people seemed to have more authority than others, and, and how that came to be. And uh, frequently, there was this connection made between authority and vision. Hmm. Somebody who has authority is somebody who has vision. See, I think that when you look at somebody like Mother Teresa, or you look at somebody like Martin Luther King Jr., these aren't actually people with a lot of power. I think they're people with a lot of authority. Hmm. They have a dream. They have a vision. And, um, and that is what I would like to give children. I would like to give them uh, a deep education that is an introduction to reality, a vision of the world, a shared vision of the world. And I think that gives them some kind of authority in their own lives, in their own families, and in culture generally. What do you think? Um, I, uh, I mean, I, the, the interplay between power and authority, um, I can see that. I'm, I'm not sure if I totally see a huge distinction, but mm. the fundamental point that the vision that you're talking about is, uh, is universally accessible, which is a beautiful thing, which means that if you're in the heart of the South Bronx or Appalachia or wherever, that means you can access it too, um, because it's a vision of your own life, right? Mm. It's a vision that it's not, it's not curtailed by your circumstance, and that's one of the most important things that we try to give um, or empower for our students, that you don't have to rely upon some other outside force hmm. in order for you to be able to exercise 
the free will that you have in your own life informed by these key pillars. So, so I, I think there's overlap mm -hmm. um, between what we're saying. Okay, so uh, we'll call that a truth. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so, uh, Peter, I want to I want to start with you for uh, for um, for this next question. Um, uh, I think we heard some this morning about the the way in which a um, a school, whether it's a research university or a liberal arts college or a um, or, or an excellent high school, is a culture, and um, you have described, uh, you have particularly emphasized in your writing, the importance of forming not just students through a culture but teachers through a um, through a culture. So, how do you think about that that project of the formation of of, of adult educators? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that, that question. I think it, it's, in some ways, the key question. Um, you know, I want to step back and say that we have to re-understand what schools are. So we have kind of an instinct to think of schools as models, as book lists, um, uh, you know, something that can be franchised. And, of course, book lists, Curriculum, uh, even models, systems, these are important. And a school requires them, but they're not the essence of what a school is. Mm -hmm. A school is a community. First and foremost, a school is a community of, of persons. And um, so in the development of a community, um, such as a school, the most important moment is the faculty, mm. uh, the faculty community. So there are a couple of reasons for this. Most importantly, the most important lesson that a child will ever learn is in class is the living lesson that a teacher is. Mm. So if you think back to, I don't know, fifth grade, fourth grade, if you're anything like me, you don't remember any of the content that you learned. Do you remember all the books? Do you remember? I mean, maybe some, maybe something struck you. But usually, we have a much deeper memory of people, mm. of relationships, of those interactions. And so not to say that the curriculum and the content is unimportant. It's critically important. It's just to say that the primary lesson, the first lesson, is the human person who is the authority within the classroom. And then the faculty community is the great lesson to the student community. So if you want to have an amazing student culture, you need to look to the faculty culture. Mm. Whatever you see in your student culture that you don't like, you need to look to the faculty and ask them to be those great models to, uh, to the students. It's kind of like when, I think, my experience anyway, of being a parent. If I see something in my kids and I'm like, there's something wrong, I always need to look to myself. Hmm. Almost always there's something that's unsettled in myself that's being reflected in my kids, even if I try to hide it. So, um, so this is a critical question. The most important, this to cheat, uh, the most important answer is to hire well, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, my title is head master, head teacher. Uh, and the most important thing I do as the head master, the head teacher, is to hire the faculty and to develop that faculty community. And I think that um, one of the problems that we frequently have as a society is we are hiring precisely the wrong people to be teachers. Hmm. So I think the question, for really to boil it down, that we need to ask ourselves when we're looking at a, at a teacher candidate and thinking about whether or not we should hire them is, is this man or woman the man or woman I want the children my care to become? Mm -hmm. Is this person a model for a great man or a great woman? And that 
is why teaching is vocational. Mm. Because it's this higher calling in which you yourself are the living lesson and you are forming through who you are the children who are in your care. And of course, none of us, there are a lot of teachers in the room, I think, none of us live up to that. And so it's a constant call to improve ourselves, to become more and more excellent. And so that means that this person has to be incredibly humble. Hmm. I don't think you can be a good teacher. I don't think you can be a great teacher unless you are deeply humble and have this, uh, what was referred to earlier, as this lifelong yearning to improve mm -hmm. and to become a better and better gift to your, to your students. Um, so that's, I think, at least important context. If you don't have at least some of that in place, then I don't care what your faculty formation program is. Mm. It's not going to work. You have to have that, that foundation first. Um, and then I think that the formation that you provide teachers built on that foundation has to be extremely regular and extremely attentive to the reality of their classroom and who they are as persons. So um, for, for us at the St. Jerome Institute, we spend uh, either five or six weeks in teacher training in the summer. And we say this is to give teachers a confident start to the school year. And in many ways, it's an important time uh, where we uh, do a lot of seminaring, actually, on uh, beautiful texts. But also, we speak about pedagogy and how to practically manage a classroom, and also uh, make sure that the way we're introducing reality to students is, is somehow uh, in harmony, as a symphony together. Um, but I think that actually this teacher formation, this summer formation, is the least important part mm. of the formation that we provide to teachers. I think the most important part happens throughout the school year. And so uh, at least at the schools that I've been a headmaster of, um, our uh, sort of audacious goal is to visit every teacher once a week, to visit their classroom, um, and to observe at least a portion of their class to uh, honestly to enjoy it, to participate in it, uh, maybe not actively, um, but to, to see it for what it is, and then to provide that teacher an opportunity for conversation and sometimes written feedback as well throughout the course of the year. So it's this continuous conversation. I think a lot of teachers in a lot of places, they get observed once a year, mm -hmm. maybe once a semester. And, uh, and that you know, affects the conversation between the administrator and the teacher. If you get seen by an administrator once a year, it can only be an evaluative mm -hmm. observation. And, and therefore, uh, you know, it's skewed in that direction. If you're in classrooms on a regular basis and have a continuous conversation with teachers uh, throughout their entire time at the school, then it is a shared love of the craft of teaching. Mm. And, um, and I think that, uh, is, is something that the teachers, uh, context in which good teachers thrive. Mm -hmm. So, see, so and how, how do you think about this? How do you think about forming a, a culture of, of yeah. teachers? And, and I think you sometimes like to include principals in this. Um, uh, in this I, was, I was going to say, other than the, the first important decision um, in terms of uh, your people, uh, principal. It's crucial, and it's often sort of, we kind of just leap over <laughs> um, that uh, position because you said the headmaster, principal, that's the person that really then shapes the culture and the hiring. Um, but when it comes to faculty, I mean, it is interesting. Historically, when we have hired for teachers, there were primarily two factors that we were focused on. One, uh, subject matter knowledge, and two, uh, pedagogical capacity. You know? mm -hmm. Do you know your stuff, and do you have the ability to teach? And that usually you know, got you most of the way. But increasingly, certainly over the last few years, there's this third dimension of, of really sort of ideological alignment mm. uh, has become very uh, important. And when I say ideological alignment, you know, one of the things that we really stress with at Vertex is this idea of democratic discourse and viewpoint diversity. 
Right, so I've done a couple of debates on C-SPAN, uh, arguing against critical race theory um, you know, with, with a quote-unquote expert on critical race theory who'd never heard of Thomas Sowell, just to give you a sense of her credentials. <laughs> um, uh, but it, you know, it's a very constructive debate. I think I win, but you know, I think it's, I think it's, a, very, it's a very constructive debate. Um, but we now make watching that debate part of our interview process. Mm -hmm. Any person who wants to teach at Vertex, you, gotta, you have to watch it, and then in the discussion afterwards, it's not that you, know, you must agree with everything that the CEO of this organization um, stands for, but can you handle, like, could you create this kind of democratic discourse within mm -hmm. your own classroom? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's what we want. You know, I, you can be against, um, you can be for critical race theory, but you're not coming in to indoctrinate um, or indoctrinate in something that we're trying to indoctrinate, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it, is, it is very important. This, this, and, and absolutely, the culture of observation, once they're on board, um, I, was just, I just visited a, a great school uh, in England, the Michaela School, and um, at the back of each classroom, there are two seats, every single classroom. Um, because they've created this mechanism where everyone observes everyone. Yeah. So it's not even just the, the once a year principle. It's every teacher, you can go in for 20 minutes, 30 minutes to, to visit your peer, and it's just become part of the culture. So it's not a gotcha. It's like, because you know at some point someone's going to come into your classroom, yeah. and so the feedback is more organic, it's trusted, and so that's something we're going to uh, try to achieve as well. So. Hiring well, alignment with your core virtues, and then a culture of observation where we're kind of in this together, mm. you know, uh, as opposed to the hierarchy, which does typically exist, where, oh no, I'm bracing for that, you know, seven minute observation <laughs> where my, you know, my entire year will be based on those seven minutes. And that, that I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, deprofessionalizes what we're trying to accomplish with teaching. Mm. So we have been. Our focus in, in this conversation has been profoundly on the, on, the, on the morally formative culture of the school. And Ian, you're, you're willing to go, uh, go, go uh, as far as describing this as, as, a, as a kind of indoctrination in a, in a positive sense. Well, let's just say what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the thing is, you, if you're running a school, you are in the moral formation business. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so... Excellent. Again, make the implicit explicit. So just be clear about what your values are, what you stand for. Why would you do that? You know, that's. Uh, I think that's. I think that's very helpful. I think, it, but it, but it leads us to a paradox, which is that our our, our conversation this morning with uh, Amanda Woodward and and um, and Walter Sterling uh, largely turned around um, questions of the culture of free inquiry, and I know that that culture is actually something that, that, that the two of you both care about. And so given your sense that teachers, which, which I entirely agree with, that teachers are in the moral formation business, they can't avoid being in the moral formation business, you stand at the front of a classroom with a kind of authority, and that is, uh, that is something that you, uh, that, that you do well or you do badly, but you do not not do. Right. Um, just do it intentionally, right. whatever it is, just right. be intentional. So, so then how do we understand, if that's true, then how do we understand the culture of free inquiry that um, I think not only, uh, is certainly very important at the, um, at the level of higher education, but I think is also involved in, in K to 12 schooling. What is, the, what is the place of freedom in a morally formative culture? Yeah, it's, it's really, I was fascinated by the conversation this morning because the, the idea of institutional neutrality is crucial. Mm -hmm. Like these two things, I think, can coexist: institutional neutrality, as well as having an explicit set of values and virtues that you stand for. Mm. So, um, I just thought of this. Some some of you may have seen about a month ago uh, across the country there was something called the National Day of Silence. How many people have heard of that? Oh, okay, a few. Interesting. Mm. So, the National Day of Silence, uh, organized by uh, GLSEN, which I think is the Gay and Lesbian Student Education Network, um, essentially has 
clubs across the country at high schools, primarily high schools, but even down lower, where on the day of silence, kids go into school, sometimes wearing black, and they uh, refuse to participate. They, they, they're just, they're silent. They're not, <laughs> they're not, they're not engaged. They're, they're, they're protesting. And the thing that they're protesting is um, discrimination, in their view, discrimination against gay and lesbian students across the country, right? So that's the, that's the protest. These kids are not speaking. And at many schools, uh, the teachers are essentially given guidance to cut the kids some slack, right? You know, whereas normally you'd be participating in class, you'd be speaking, right? Because that's part of the teaching and learning process. But on that day, in a lot of schools, the, basically the administration says, teachers, let them off the hook, mm -hmm. right? Now, it sounds like that's, you know, we're really supporting the kids, we're giving them um, an opportunity to protest, to express their voice. I actually think um, it's corrosive. Mm. Why? Because let's say you're a kid that has an issue that you want to protest um, that may not be favored by the teachers in your school, right? And suddenly, you see that the administration has supported this particular mm. issue. Mm. But I think they wouldn't support mine, so better I just not really express it. And so that's why I think, like the Calvin Report, Chicago, this, this statement of neutrality where the, if, you really want to ex if you really want to facilitate free inquiry, the institution actually has to step back mm. and not put its thumb on the scale on any given issue, because the tendency will be that you're signaling to your faculty, to your students, what, what is legit versus what is not legit in terms of mm -hmm. what we will support or what you might face consequences mm -hmm. to do. So, so in this day of silence, I, like for example, I advocate, sure, a kid has um, First Amendment rights. They just have to be willing to face the consequences of violating the code of conduct or reasonable expectations for teaching and learning mm -hmm. during the day, but you can't have the administration say, um, you know, you're, you're good because you're protesting an issue that we like, mm -hmm. right? What happens when a kid wants to protest an issue that we don't like? So I think, so all this is to say, if you really want free inquiry, the, the institution has to have the restraint mm -hmm. to not um, tell you as a learning student what you should, you know, what issue or political or social activism you should be on board with, because by that very nature, you're you're going to have a chilling effect on those that may believe something differently. Hmm. Peter, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, for a liberal arts academy, liberal arts school. Um, the whole purpose of this school is to learn the arts of freedom. Um, so we are practicing how to be free. I think it's tempting for us as a society to often conflate freedom with license. Hmm. But freedom, real freedom, requires a certain kind of discipline. It requires a certain kind of... Um, growth into that freedom and education into that freedom. So it's not just an opportunity to make whatever choice you want. Freedom, I think, is traditionally understood as freedom for something. And I think ultimately that means freedom for one's destiny, freedom for one's deeper purpose. Mm. Um, so uh, like any other art, the art of freedom has limits, has constraints. You can't be free. You can't be fundamentally free if you just have nothing but license. So in order to allow students, for instance, to be free to focus on mm. their studies and on their friendships, you have to bracket certain things that shouldn't be at the school, mm. certain things that distract from their freedom to focus on their studies. And I think it's not even, I mean, certainly there are moral questions here. 
But I think it's, it's also um, a question of things that are not just of a moral character, but are distracting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for instance, very controversially, at the St. Jerome Institute, we have a policy where the students don't talk about uh, pop culture or contemporary politics. It's not because we think that pop culture or contemporary politics are bad. And in fact, I think there are a lot of risks to this policy. Mm. If the students had no taste in popular culture, had no knowledge of contemporary politics, we would be really doing them a disservice. My mm. presumption is that it's coming from home. And my experience is that it's coming from home. I don't think that our students have no political sense or taste in pop culture. I have lots of evidence to the contrary. But the reason that we do practice this discipline is so that when they read a book, they aren't just projecting the most easily digestible things in their lives mm. on that book. Mm. It's really hard to read The Republic. It's really hard to read the Nicomachean Ethics. It's really hard to have a conversation about justice. And if what we do is we take some analogy from our favorite TV show and presume that that tells us what justice is and then put it on the Republic, we've never actually read the Republic. Hmm. And we've never actually grown and, 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 and been educated in that way. And so I think that freedom requires discipline, mm. and it uh, means uh, putting things to the side so that you can be free, so that you can practice the art of freedom. Mm. All right, well, these uh, gentlemen have said many provoking things. The, um, I, I, I hope that you were provoked. The, um, and we've got a, um, uh, we've got a bit of uh, uh, time for questions now. Let's see, why don't we start with Paul Carice back there. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Curries from Arizona State University. I'll give the title, long title of the school because it tips up the question. School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. My question is about civic education. It came up in my mind in the first session, then with Nat uh, Malka saying, beware of being a crusader for you know, one objective of education over others. But I'll, I'll respond to that by posing the question, isn't the, just the references here to freedom. Isn't it the case that in the current moment in America, we could use a bit of recalibration to emphasize the nexus between a liberal arts education mm -hmm. and civic education for citizens of a particular constitutional order, the American constitutional order, not as a negative tension, but as a mutually revitalizing approach uh, across a range of disciplines, and this is a K-12 and in higher education. And just to mention one, one reference, who I think could be an, an ally in relation to these conversations at AEI, uh, the president of Johns Hopkins University, Ron Daniels, publishing a book a couple of years ago, What Universities Owe Democracy. Mm. The, the head of the first research university in the country, now 150 years in, saying, well, one unintended consequence of the focus on research universities was to lose the liberal arts core, which provided a civic education. Mm. So whether you're a research university or a college, public or private, at this moment, this is what every higher education institution owes. And then I'll stop by saying, and he realizes there needs to be a reconnection between K-12 mm. and higher education on this blending of liberal arts education and civic education. So if you would respond to that yeah. approach. I, I just want to thank Paul for uh, asking one of the questions that I uh, left off the um, for the uh, for the sake of time. The <laughs> the uh, this is uh, I I wanted to ask you all exactly about the um, the place of civic education in the educational projects that you're that you're engaged in. Um, my answer to this is uh, 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 probably slightly different in that. Uh, I think we're all rightfully concerned about civic education. The most recent NAEP data just came out once again showing you know, our kids are woefully misunderstanding American history. Um, but my starting point here is that the civic institution that's most important to our country 
uh, is a strong family. Um, and often when we talk about civic education, we're talking about democracy. We're, we're talking about all the things that make logical sense. And again, we leap over the institution, the, 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 the first institution uh, through which our kids understand who they are, who their connections are. It's, it's very difficult to make connections to your city, your country, your continent, if you haven't even made connections to the people in the most immediate sphere of your life. And I think if we were to somehow strengthen the, the very real idea that family is the first important civic institution that we should be concerned about, we're not gonna have as much success with all the other institutions that we're most uh, concerned with. So that's why, like for example, in our schools, we teach the success sequence, right? So which many of you probably are familiar with that you know, for us, our students, regardless of the families that they're from, the families that they're on the pathway to form can have a huge impact in their lives. And so that's why we teach. If you finish just your high school degree, get a full-time job of any kind, just so you learn the dignity and discipline of work. And if you have kids, marriage first. 97% of millennials who follow that set of behaviors avoid poverty, and the vast majority enter the middle class or beyond. It's not 100%. It's not a guarantee, but when you look at the data from kids who make those kinds of decisions, their level of civic participation in every other future institution is dramatically higher. And so we're now at a time where non-marital birth, or even though overall birth rates are low, we're still, you know, we've, we're still at 40% non-marital birth rates across our country. In certain communities, it's 70, 80%. It's really hard to build civic institutions with that as your foundation. You know, I mean, one of the things that we haven't had an opportunity to, you know, uh, in this conversation at any rate, I think it was referenced earlier today, um, but distinguish is education as it's found at home versus at schools and what the proper role of a school is versus the proper role of a family is in the education of a child. And I, I think uh, I agree that the, the, there's, a, there's a primacy in the family uh, offering that civic education to, uh, to, to kids. I think that um, schools play a role in that as well. So I, I'll just say, I think that one of the things that can be disappointing uh, in some classical liberal arts types of schools is that graduates uh, can sometimes detach from uh, culture and community of our mm -hmm. society. And uh, there can be a temptation to, uh, you know, uh, reside in the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you are truly a student of uh, the Western tradition, if you're truly a liberal arts student, then there is an imperative that is placed on you to be a member of society, to engage in your community, and to, take, and to take action. And, um, and I think that uh, a true liberal arts school needs to be able to do that, so. Uh, let's see, the, the, this, this lady up front here, who's, who's um, unfortunately whose name I don't know. The, uh, Rachel. Rachel. Uh, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Ferguson from Concordia University, Chicago. Um, I was really struck by Headmaster Crawford's point about who you hire as teachers and the way that the character of the teacher comes through to the student. And it reminded me of the short period in which I was an English lit major before I went into philosophy. Um, one of the things that struck me was that the English education majors were starkly different from the English literature majors. Mm. They were not as curious, they were not as interested. It, this seemed to, to me to be sort of a secure career pathway, but not something that was really flowing you know, from within them. And so I guess the question it brought to mind is, what is happening, what, what is the incentive structure in our schools of education that is attracting um, not the people that we want mm -hmm. <laughs> to teach our, our students, and how are you all finding teachers 
that have the kind of qualities that we want to convey in such a, at least from my perspective, not, not a good environment in terms of the way we train and attract teachers? Yeah. That's a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, I hear a lot about uh, principals and, and headmasters complaining about teacher shortages, a difficulty in finding uh, teachers. And um, I am not familiar with this problem. Hmm. Um, now, I'm not saying it isn't there. And I'm, I, I think, uh, for instance, I have certain luxuries. Like, I'm in DC. I mean, you know, I, I have uh, certain, you know, I'm in a large urban center. But, you know, like we at SJI had to hire this year, I think, like two positions, let's say. And we had, um, I think, 43 qualified applications for those positions. Mm -hmm. And let's say 30 of them were really excellent applications. So um, I think that there are a tremendous number of people out there, people who have a great passion for contributing to the future of our culture and to uh, giving the great gifts that they've been given to the younger generations. Um, and I've, I've always found that, uh, that those people are, are out there and thirsty to be given a job with deep purpose and meaning. But I think that a lot of those people don't know that they want to be teachers mm. because of the way that we see teaching as a society. Mm. Teaching is not considered to be a noble profession. We pay lip service to it, right? Mm -hmm. We pretend it's important. But um, I think we all know that it is not given an honorable station in our minds or in the way that we talk or in public discourse. And uh, I think that a lot of times people identify a major in education, a degree in education, as about as interesting and entertaining as spending four years at the DMV, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I think that, first of all, we have to convince people that teaching is this extremely noble profession, something that you have to aspire to. It is a different kind of job than most jobs. It is a higher job than most jobs. It is um, not on the same level as, as selling cars and, uh, or perfume or whatever, right? It's on another level because of the essence of education, as we've been talking about it today, of that importance. Um, so a lot of times, people, young people, want to make a difference. They just don't think that you can do that as a teacher, hmm. especially conservatives. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but some thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, I mean, you asked an interesting question. How do we, how do we find, how do we find our teachers? And frankly, what we are trying to do is flip that around and how do we, how do the amazing people that we want find us? Yeah. Um, and the way that we want to do that is strongly project what we stand for. You know, um, you know, I do events like this, or, or <laughs> where I say people who uh, want to apply to Vertex have to watch uh, C-SPAN, the critical race theory. Some people say, oh my god, that sounds terrible. But the right people say, <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah. That's cool, right? So, so th there, are, there are a good number of really talented, disaffected teachers, especially in the last few years, mm -hmm. who've grown very frustrated with a greater push to view your students as simply avatars of their race or their class or their gender, and that's not what these teachers want to do. They, they are as into social justice, but not in the capital S, capital J, as it's often defined. And so our core group of teachers have been our greatest source for finding similarly minded um, teachers who that once they hear the kinds of things that we stand for, um, that really helps us uh, in the recruitment process, for sure. Uh, Michael Tomko from Villanova. Yes, thank you. 
thank you, Ben. And uh, I just wanted to circle back to something Peter said uh, initially in the, in the response to the question that one of the things you look to cultivate as part of the education process are sacred memory, memories or memories of the good. And I've been thinking about, I've remembered that. Um, but I, I, I'd like to hear more and, and I'd be really interested in how that is incorporated or enabled in your schools. And then Ian, if you had any similar reflections from your own experience, I'd be, I'd be really fascinated to hear that. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, the reference uh, that I'm thinking of is coming from Brothers Karamazov. And at the end of, of the book, there's this meditation that um, perhaps it is the memories that we have as children, uh, memories of good things, that will play a salvific role in our lives later. And um, I have personally found this to be, to be true, that when I, uh, let's say, uh, was in my own uh, low point in life, that it was recollecting, remembering um, uh, my parents and what they had taught me and what I had received at the dinner table and what we stood for as a family that uh, was a compass for me in finding my way. I think that if a person doesn't have memories of goodness, I mean, look, I believe in grace, and I believe in redemption, and I believe in, in miracles. But I think that without memory of, of memories of goodness from one's childhood, mm -hmm. it is incredibly difficult for a person to find the right path when they hit that valley of darkness, hmm. which they inevitably will, right? We send kids off and we pretend as educators, as parents, that if we created the right environment and we taught them the right things, that they go off and they do all the things they ought to do. And that's not true. Hmm. We're not in that, we don't have that much control. Hmm. I went through this transition, you know, being a, a, a teacher in my 20s to being uh, a headmaster, still teacher, but also a headmaster in my 30s, realizing that I had vastly overestimated the, uh, the power of formation that I had mm -hmm. over the children in my care. And so I say, kind of as a, like, let's call it the last ditch effort, like the most, like the, the, the thing that has to happen if nothing else does, that if I can give them memories of something beautiful, hmm. then that, can, that is a, an important gift that they can carry with them, and I probably will never know the results of it. But I have great hope that it will take, it will take root, that it will blossom. Um, so how do you do that? Well, uh, I think you, you cultivate a culture of friendship, of love, of a uh, of, uh, sense of, of rightness. You look at your school as being a community, not the DMV. You look at it as being um, a, a forum of relationships. You foster those. And then I think you read beautiful things. You study great art. You learn the stories of the great heroes in history, um, you engage in deep and beautiful good things. And I think that's manna for the students mm. to take with them uh, for, the rest, for the rest of their lives. Mm. Yeah, I, I loved your line about sacred memories. I, I mentioned I visited a school, the Michaela School in, uh, in Wembley mm. in northern London in January, and they have an incredible um, culture and tradition around oral recitation of poetry. And so, um, so I was there for the whole day, but lunch, the lunch period is incredible because they're, they're analyzing this deep moral question. But the last 20 minutes, the entire student body, the grade, stands up and they're reciting poetry. Yeah. And so when I was there, they first did um, If uh, by mm -hmm. Kipling. And then they recited um, 
uh, William Ernest Henley's uh, Invictus. So imagine this whole room of about 120, almost all low-income kids from all challenging situations, but in that moment, they're there with their blazers, you know, just standing strong. You know, they end this stanza, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Oh my gosh, the whole room was exploded with energy. And you just realize that these, these, are, these are the sacred memories. And then ironically, a couple of months later, I was doing um, the Glenn Lowry show, and I was uh, describing to him my visit. And I said, and these kids, they recited Invictus by William Ernest Henley. And the kids said, and then Glenn Lowry stops me, and he starts to recite Invictus <laughs> from when he learned it 50 years ago. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so that is how, and we are certainly going to be committed to building that part of our culture, the oral recitation of poetry. It's mm. a beautiful and magical thing. Mm. Uh, is that uh, Angel Adams Parham? Thanks. Hi, I'm Angel Adams Parham from the University of Virginia, and um, I'm struck by various aspects of what you're both saying. And I, I'm asking a question about um, trying to think about how your your visions and your approaches might work together. Um, so for for Peter, I you know I'm a, a big proponent of classical education. So just thoroughly love pretty much everything you said about the vision of it, but. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how the classical education movement is doing in terms of working with kids coming from disadvantage um, who are really struggling. Um, and wonder, you know, kind of what you would take from what Ian is doing that you think might be useful um, in terms of giving more kids access to a classical education. And then for Ian, I'm really curious your thoughts. I don't know how much you follow what's going on in classical education circles, but curious your thoughts about classical education for the kinds of kids that you are working with. Mm -hmm. um, I also have some experience working you know, with trying to do classical education with less advantaged kids, mostly African-American, and I have strong feelings about why it's a great thing, but I know that it's not something that many people are necessarily convinced of, yep. especially in communities of color. Yep. And so just wondered some of your thoughts on classical education for the kinds of kids that you're working with. Yep. Um, can you go first? Or? Please. No, no, so uh, full disclosure, this morning, uh, I was in, uh, in touch with uh, Anika uh, on how uh, hopefully Vertex will work with uh, Johns Hopkins on crafting uh, a canon which is both um, the shared inheritance of all the classics that, again, are universal, uh, available to everyone, while also incorporating more contemporary, um, great work still, but that um, help to fill in, um, in a way, but again, all still around our cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. Um, so there will be, uh, and this will, it will include books and poetry and art that's required every single kid, and, and there will be certain poems, and Invictus will be one of them, um, <laughs> that every kid's going to have to learn. And most importantly, learn the conditions under which William Ernest Henley wrote that poem, right? The adverse, the personal adversity he was going through to write these words. So it's not just it's not just learning the words, it's learning the context um, within which um, uh, these things occur. So I do, I'm hoping to find um, a great balance. I mean, in New York City, there's a movement to jettison Shakespeare um, from high schools. And I, you know, the people who advocate for that, I just, they claim that they're acting in the best interests of kids. And um, I just think it's, it's a huge disservice. You know, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, you know, that someone has to lose uh, in order for you to, to be inclusive. And yes, every time you create a canon, there's always, there's some that are in and some that are out. But um, I think there's, um, 
there's an extremism happening that ultimately will be harmful to kids, I think. There's a way to do both. So, I, I mean, I think that um, I don't know the answer to all of those questions. Um, I have suspicions, I have thoughts, I have theories. Um, but I, would, I have a lot to learn in this area. And I know that I have a lot to learn um, from folks doing the sort of work that Ian's doing. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so I think that's a really important preface. Um, now, that being said, and I know, by the way, um, that classical is not a silver bullet. And I know that uh, there have been a number of classical schools that have failed. And there have been a number of classical schools that have had their primary goal be serve, uh, to serve underprivileged kids that have failed. Um, and uh, I think it's really important that we ask why and not ignore it and, and just sort of preach classical or something. Um, here's, here's what I do know. So um, at a school that I had in San Antonio, Great Hearts Charter School, we did have a diversity of students. Um, now, I think sometimes when people use the word diversity, they don't actually mean diverse. They mean uh, just underprivileged kids. But I mean actually diverse. So we had, I you know, had this class on, uh, you know, we, so we were um, this particular year of 10th graders. And I had a, a kid, white kid from uh, middle class suburbia sitting next to a homeless black girl, sitting next to a Latino kid whose grandfather's name was on the convention building downtown. Hmm. So all these kids are together. They're in uniform. And we're talking about Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. And we're not talking about contemporary politics or pop culture. We're talking about sin or evil, murder, and guilt, mm. and the possibility of redemption, mm. even from the most heinous of crimes. In other words, we're talking about things that are universal. And I can tell you that within that context, all of these kids and all of their other peers sitting around that table were bringing something incredibly important to the conversation, something different, but important. And all of them were learning from each other while learning from Dostoevsky. So I think that we have underestimated kids, all kids, actually in terms of not only what they can read and what they can come to know, but what they can fall in love with, what they can see as important. And um, I, I think that you cannot have one universal pedagogical approach. Um, I think that as a teacher, you have to recognize the reality of the students in front of you and try to uh, meet them and engage them but I also think that all children have a deep thirst to know, have a longing for these great questions, and um, all of them should have an opportunity in one form or another to engage in them. Uh, this person over here. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your remarks, both of you. Um, it reminded me of two quotes, actually, that I heard very recently. One was from Ryan Priebus, who said, if we want to change the city of DC, we need a Christian school here. Um, the other one is Michelle Obama, who recently also said that if we want to change the world, more parents should be focused on becoming better parents. Mm -hmm. And so those two quotes just kind of summarize what you both said. Mm -hmm. And so there seems to be a trend to maybe focus more on um, locally driven um, kind of catalyst for culture transformation. Any thoughts on how to encourage more of that trend towards really, you know, well, to put Tocqueville to civil associations? Um, well, Michelle Obama's quote, more parents should become better parents. Um, sure. Uh, you know, when, when her husband was uh, 
running for president, uh, and even when he was president for the first year or two, he was a strong advocate for marriage and strong fatherhood. So it wasn't just this be better parents thing. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I think, I think we lose out when we're not specific about what we mean. Because there are, there are lots of parents, um, but the, the, the structures within which children are being raised today are very different. Um, and so anyway, so I, I, I would hopefully amend her statement to um, have a revitalization around marriage as the institution that is best for kids. And as far as uh, pre, pre, um, uh, Ryan, I can never pronounce his first name. Ryan's Priebus? Yeah, yeah, yeah Ryan's Priebus. Um, Christian schools, sure. Um, and, and in fact, there is, there is since, since uh, COVID, particularly Catholic schools, because Catholic schools remained open generally and stood for a set of values that made it harder for, in my view, woke ideology to sort of infiltrate those schools, have had a resurgence in enrollment, which I think is really powerful. And in more and more states, there are now vouchers and other things that's going to make it more possible for religious institutions to be able to access public dollars. So on the first two institutions that I care about the most, family and religion, is the, and then obviously uh, education next, um, there's some hope there, I think, in terms of strengthening the pillars, I think, will make a difference for kids. Yeah, I'll just say, um, you know, so I, I hold that uh, family, parents are the, the primary educators of their children, and I think uh, we should mean that more deeply than we often do, which is, I mean, that it is inevitably true, actually. It's not how it ought to be, it is how it is. Um, I mean, it, that kind of education begins even kind of genetically, epigenetically. So um, that, uh, that is the soil from which we're drawing students, I think is important for us to remember. It's also important to remember that um, sometimes what's happening in schools affects dinner tables. Mm. So it, there is a return um, that can occur at a great school I think you can have the audacious goal to, yeah, to form the conversations that are occurring in the evenings and on the weekends. Um, and so there is, there's a, a dialogue possible, possible there. Um, I'm the headmaster of a, of a <laughs> Catholic school, so I uh, do support Christian schools opening and I uh, think, you know, look, um, the truth is that uh, I think it's fair to say that Catholic education has been dwindling for decades, and in fact is in dire straits. If we like Catholic education, we should be very concerned. <laughs> um, because it's, it, I mean, I, I have friends who believe that uh, there is no future to Catholic education, that it will, it will you know, slowly be extinguished over time. Um, but I think there are reasons to think that Catholic schools, Christian schools, offer a kind of clarity uh, in vision and the vision of the world that our society is in desperate need of and will become increasingly in need of as we move, as we move forward during some confused, some confused times. And I think there's reason to think that uh, some resurgence is possible. And I also think that a lot of schools should close. And that's fine um, if what we're left with is a, a smaller number of really excellent, beautiful schools that are a good model of what Christian or Catholic education can be. So. OK, uh, Rick Avramenko, last question. Sorry, debate going on in our home parish right now. School uniforms are not. Why and why not? Hundred <laughs> percent, and in fact, uh, at Vertex, we this was our first year. We had uh, uniforms which were um, polo shirts, kind of kind of sweat pantsy um, <laughs> bottoms. Kids could wear sneakers. And eh. um, <laughs> uh, next year, Oxford shirt. 
blazer with the Vertex logo, you know, home of the lions, um, black slacks. Um, you know, in, in uh, two and a half weeks, we're bringing about 70 students, 70 of our ninth grade students here to this room uh, to meet with Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas for an hour. Uh, and it's going to be amazing. And they're going to be in an Oxford shirt, their blazer, their, because they're going to be representing themselves and our schools. And mm -hmm. uniforms, in my view, and presumably you, you agree, it make a huge difference in the, in the signal that you send to the world. And so that's a critical part of, because it's the first thing you see. Other, other than you know, your facial uh, characteristics, the first thing you see is a group of kids who are obviously all part of something special. Absolutely, yeah, uniforms I think are uh, significantly important. And not only do they signal something to the outside community, they signal something to the students. Ah. We share an identity um, that we belong to one family, one group, um, and that's, that's of significant pedagogical importance. Also, I think clothes do make the man. I think we act differently when we dress in a way that shows that we take ourselves seriously that shows that we take our classes seriously and our teachers seriously. So, um, uh, and it avoids a ton of distractions. Oh yeah. Uh, that uh, I think, I mean, just for your own sense of survival, you should have <laughs> uniforms. Mm. So. All right, you all. Well, we are um, coming to the end of our program, and I'll take a moment for a final remark of, of my own before we thank our speakers and, and, um, and some other people who have been in, involved in running the day. So there are a lot of um, very busy educators, people involved in education reform um, uh, who, who have made the journey to be in the room today. And I know that you all like have work to do. The, uh, and that this is not um, nothing for you and your families. And we're very grateful that you did that. And we're very grateful that you did it in particular to consider a question as abstract as the question of what education is. As we remarked earlier in the day, my, my wife and I posed the most abstract question on purpose. <laughs> and the reason we wanted to pose the most abstract question is because on these general questions, on these universal questions, in a democratic and republican country like ours, we do not defer to any authority. We do not defer to experts. On the most fundamental questions, we decide for ourselves. And so Americans decide what they think is a good school. Americans decide what they think ought to be going on in the classroom. And that desire to have some influence on this is becoming ever stronger. In a Republican society like ours, general competence is the competence of every citizen. To exercise that competence well, you actually have to educate yourself on these matters. You actually have to investigate the fundamental question that it is our charge as common citizens to decide. And so we took the time today to raise the question that is important to us, not simply as educators, although everybody who's been up here today has spent their life doing that work, but as common Americans overseeing the project of transmission that Nat Malkus described for us earlier today which is perhaps the most important civilizational project in which we're all engaged. So with that, let me thank everybody who took the time to be here today. Let me say there are a lot of college professors in the room. Uh, if you would like to stay involved with the American Enterprise Institute, if you would like your students to come here for our summer programming, there are a number of people involved with our academic programs team who are in the room. I see Jeff Pickering and Kate Ganjami and, and Lauren Collins back there. Dan, please connect with them, and they can help you uh, figure out how to get AEI on your campus and how to get your students here at AEI. 
I also want to thank uh, the extraordinary AEI events team who put this uh, whole thing together. And uh, in particular, to thank Noah Rosenfield, the, um, our uh, uh, research assistant. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> Noah, Noah made all the lists. He fielded thousands of emails. He, feel, he fielded thousands of text messages from me alone <laughs> the, um, in, uh, in order to put this, uh, put this whole thing together. And it has been um, uh, an extraordinarily patient and uh, competent labor. And we're very grateful to him for that. Uh, and so with that, um, I thank you all and uh, hope you will return uh, to AEI for our next conference on the future of the American University uh, about this time next year. And so uh, please join me in thanking uh, Ian Rowe and Peter Crawford for their <laughs> great work.